us tomorrow. Make sure to you guys are good with it. So you all saw the email I sent. It's not going to go too far. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you, but it's not going to go too far. Yes, sir. Yeah. No. Because someone sent the wrong message all up there. And or make sure we're all saying the same message. Right. Right. Give me the wrong message. Oh, man. How did you find that? Number should provide one. Yeah. Recent version of the working document that we have. 
um, our consultant circulated a survey a week ago for counselors to provide uh, feedback on the relative importance of the topics in there to get some sense of counselors' priorities. Um, and those, uh, that information is included in your package. Um, so uh, uh, if there's any conversation the council wishes to have about that, uh, this would be great to, to do that. And then in the, uh, the second part of this process, uh, on the internal working level, uh, we're suggesting that uh, if council is satisfied with this draft document that uh, uh, you could send us back uh, as a staff to work on uh, furnishing the focus areas with uh, current activities, part of our work program, initiatives, uh, and so forth. And in the under each of the four themes and the end of our focus areas. Then we would report back to you with a document that would be a sort of a companion draft on a work plan and where we're at, and then we could work our way through where we're at and where the gaps may be in terms of what we do now, what council's priorities would be. That's the one area of process. The second, and the one I didn't address in here, is because it wasn't clear, quite clear where council was uh, feeling about this was on the public engagement piece. Um, we have, uh, we had a discussion at the last meeting about, uh, and I may be slightly off from my recollection, uh, posting uh, the draft document at a high level on the website and saying it's available if there are any comments. And secondly, if council wanted to have a special meeting or an evening or an afternoon where uh, people are invited in to have a conversation around this, and this is really, I guess, to do a check-in with the public to, to get a read on uh, is council heading in the right direction with, for, in their view on the strategic plan. So it's really, any discussion on the survey results? Are true? <laughs> and secondly, uh, what does it mean? And then secondly, a little bit of instruction from you on the process for both the uh, internal mechanism, you know, authorizing us to go away and do more work on putting information into the theme areas, and secondly, if there's anything on the public engagement side that you want to uh, clarify today, that would be good. Otherwise, we will not be doing public engagement until you get that uh, direction to do that. Councilor uh, Trickley. Yes, George, what's your name, Mr. Rudolph? So, I don't know if anybody is aware of what's gone on in the past, because I'm kind of new to this. So, uh, in the past, has it been public engagement? I, I, I can, there, there might be others that could talk about our previous, the last council's strategic plan. I can talk generically about there's different versions of public engagement. On, I think we started to have this conversation early on in the term about where you could uh, go to the public and ask for, build it from ground up, and or do you just say this is council's working document to have public input, but it doesn't have to be that robust because we just came out of the election. Some of the feedback we were hearing was that I'm not sure we hear anything more than we've already heard. And, uh, again, it's in order for us to get going on our work program faster, the sooner we deal with that issue better. So I would suggest you have the option, and the last council I just worked for, another municipality didn't have any public engagement. They just This was their document. They summed it up, they presented it, and they used it as a guide, because it's fairly hot. And then, uh, but others would find that it's beneficial to have some form of public consultation. And in terms of the last process, perhaps Councillor Thorpe could remind us what his memory was on that, or Sheila. Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Thorpe's trying hard to recall what our process four years ago. <laughs> And what did I have for dinner last night? <laughs> uh, I don't recall a formal public uh, engagement process, but Ms. Gurry, I'm sure, has a better memory than, than I do. Um, thank you, um, Your Worship, through you to Council and, and Mr. Rudolph. Um, the last Council refreshed the strategic plan, and there was no public engagement done for the last Council and the refresh of the strategic plan where they, um, I believe, changed some of the pillars and um, voted on certain projects to do, and that's where I believe the, um, the, um, the project and the focus became on the event center after the last strategic planning session. Prior to that, and the refresh that was done um, was the strategic plan that was done in 2012, 
and that was a, a, a really extensive um, from the ground up, like Mr. Rudolph was talking about engagement. Councilor Thorpe. Thank you, Worship. Through you to uh, Mr. Rudolph, and thanks, Ms. Gary. Um, so first of all, I really like the process to this point, Mr. Rudolph. I like the idea of now moving ahead and attaching some action plans to these strands. I think that'll be really important for us to see. Um, and I know some of them are well underway. Um, in terms of public engagement, I guess my feeling is this is a draft. I don't see uh, that it would be a really useful exercise to have a major event public engagement, but I see nothing wrong, of course, with posting the draft on our website, inviting comment. And if we get some very definite uh, criticisms or feedbacks or suggestions, we can take them into account. But I don't see anything necessary beyond that at this point. And one other point, if I may, uh, I, re I did the survey uh, online. I saw somewhere where you wanted us to rate prioritize these. I've done that, but I did not do it electronically. So I don't know if that was received. Probably not. Well, according to our consultant through the chair, she had nine certain oh, okay. sets of results. Okay. Well, maybe it worked for me. So that's fine then. Otherwise, I'll, I'll offer my paper copy, but that's good. Yeah, she had, she reported a full okay. response from all councillors. Good. Must have worked. Perhaps Councillor Thorpe, of course, if you used Donna's assistance in this, in which case response would have been guaranteed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what would we do with her? <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, for, for what it's worth, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with what's been said already. I, I think that uh, posting it on the website to get some set sense of, of how, not only how interested the public is, but whether we're completely off track and whether there should, should be further or more extensive engagement. Um, I don't think there's any sense laying out a long program of significant public engagement in open houses and things of that nature unless, unless it's necessary. So at this point, Councillor Department. I'll concur um, with what's being stated and I think as long as we remain open, that if we did put the draft up and we were getting, then we would look at, okay, what's the next step? Because obviously the community needs to be uh, more engaged, but let's throw it out there and see what happens. So I will move recommendations one and two if it's appropriate to worship. Absolutely. Seconded, Council Turin. Mr. Worship, just one footnote on the format. We would like to clean it up a little bit and make it more presentable. The content would be the same. But not really, it just needs to look a little more professional and version them. So we put a more polished version on the website, but the content would be exactly the same. Speaking as a politician of some experience, I'm always delighted by the suggestion staff will clean up our little messes. In the <laughs> <laughs> it's organic. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. The next item is municipal response to health and socialist issues. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, in our ongoing, uh, ongoing session of the council, I've lost track of how many we've done. I think we're at four or five in total <coughs> on the afternoons that we've set aside some time uh, to talk about current and pressing issues. And this is certainly one that's uh, it's timely, and we appreciate the opportunity uh, to get in front of you. So we have, I believe there's three three reports that we want to walk through uh, this afternoon with you. Uh, they talk about ver uh, various aspects of health and, and social issues uh, in the community. And we have uh, delegate uh, presentations for each, and I believe uh, we're hoping that uh, Dr. Hesselex can be here for one of the items. I don't see any attendance yet, but hopefully he'll be with us time to get to that item. Otherwise, we might need to uh, move the agenda around a bit just to come. Uh, so uh, Worship, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ms. Wolfelsing to, to start off the afternoon. Good afternoon. We're in your hands. Good afternoon. Thank you again for giving. Oh, Sheila? Oh, thank you, um, Lisa. I was just going to say um, for the viewers at home, when the presentation is on the screen, which they'll be able to read now, the volume goes down a little bit, so it's really important for the presenter to use the microphone. So thanks, Lisa. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Curry. Okay, so today, following up from our last session with Council, 
on February 11th where we talked about housing and homelessness. This is a continuation of an overview of some of the challenges our municipality is facing with regard to health and social issues. Um, so what you'll be getting today is three presentations, each with the reports that you've received on the agenda. The first one will be with John Horn giving an overview of the municipal response to health and social issues. Uh, this provides a context of where we're at and why we're facing these challenges in our community and what we're doing as a local government to respond to them now and moving forward. Um, we'll also have uh, Dave LaBerge, who will be part of that presentation in his role as the manager of public safety and that tie-in between our social planning function and uh, bylaws will be apparent through that. The next presentation will, will be on supervised consumption service and the history of the municipalities, our city's consideration of safe injection sites, OPS overdose prevention sites, and moving forward, um, information on ways to address um, supervised consumption sites in our community. And I do have to apologize, Dr. Hasselback, um, we'd anticipated that we'd be ready uh, at one o'clock for him to present. So he will be joining us and um, we may just have to shift our timing as Mr. Lindsay said around that. The third presentation goes with a report on a daytime resource center. Also, I think before council um, direction, it was the term drop-in center was used. And uh, Karen Constell and John Horn will both be uh, presenting on that and discussing, again, what direction we've received from council in the past and information going forward on options and how we wish to look at this going forward. And my apologies on number two, Supervised Consumption Service, it will be Karen Cronstall giving that presentation. So both Karen and John are social planners, for those of you who aren't aware, within our department. So thank you. Mr. Horn. Thank you for having us today here. What I have up here is the first slide is one report from the mustard seed folks down in Victoria. And it really has at the center of it homelessness, but it captures what really are the drivers behind what we would call the health and social issues facing our community. You have, for example, your systems failures, which is what happens when young people leave care, what happens when people leave jails and other institutions. Sometimes there's systemic failures on the part of both us as a society, but on our government as well. You have other issues that are related to structural factors. For example, the lack of affordable housing, uh, that's a driver as well. And then you've got those really interpersonal issues such as uh, experience of trauma in your lifetime, uh, having a psychiatric illness, having an addictions issue. Um, so there's that three kind of areas. So you have your structural issues, you have your broad systemic responses to these things, and then you have your individual uh, pieces around illnesses and addictions. <coughs> so you can see it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of factors at play here. So I just wanted to give you a little flavor. This gives you a nice little way of visualizing uh, the various pieces that flow into this puzzle. What I would say is for our purposes today and for the purposes of the, the local government, that really what we're looking at in that long list of things is the ones that you all know so well. We have issues around mental wellness that affect our community, physical wellness as well. You've got the issue of disconnection that captures so much of what happens around these things. You've got substance misuse, prevalent and, and um, you know big driver of things, generalized poverty, uh, trauma. We all who work in this field know how much effect trauma has on individuals and how they conduct themselves in our city. Criminality, that's an issue that pops up for the citizens. So. The areas that we're looking at today from our perspective as municipal government, that's the short list and, the, and, and sort of a very broad sweep of things, but that's really where we're at. So of course, with that laundry list of things, there's different levels of government that have different jurisdictions. I don't need to tell you, you probably know better than I, you've probably been George Cuffed and you know who does what in this world. And you know that we as a municipality have roads and sewers and parks and playgrounds and ice centers, but not on our list of things to take care of as mental illness or addictions. So nonetheless, we're deeply involved in these issues. So why? Why are we involved? What does it matter to us? Well, naturally, we don't get to do much about the drivers and the causes and the root underlying issues, but we sure get to do a lot about how it shows up in our city. 
we have areas of our city that people don't feel safe in or perceive to be unsafe or are actually unsafe arising from health and social issues. We have people sheltering in our parks, in our plazas, in our doorways, in places not meant for human habitation. We have antisocial behaviors, and I hate to use an old-fashioned word, but that's essentially how it's perceived from some folks. These aren't socially productive and enhancing behaviors. They tend to scare people a little bit. You've got open drug use and inebriation in the uh, public areas of our city. Public urina urination and defecation, constant refrain, uh, refrain from the merchant class. Uh, graffiti and property damage. Uh, discarded drug paraphernalia, we can talk about syringes and where they land. Increased litter, these sort of things. You know? So we need to manage those impacts on the community while recognizing that these aren't folks that came here from outer space. They live in our community, they're our citizens. We do have the same civic obligations we do to all our citizens, even if they're unhoused. They're part of our civic fabric and they are citizens within our community. So we do have some obligation to them. So I think what I'd like to do at this point is allow my colleague, where is he? Mr. LaBerge, to talk a little bit about the bylaws overview of how these things show up in the, in, in the public safety and bylaws department. Mr. LaBerge? I would call him Kirk LaBerge, but <laughs> retired Kirk LaBerge. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. LaBerge. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. I could have used John's uh, slides. It looks like we had the, the same ideas in mind. What I'd like to do is take a few minutes and walk you through actually a visual representation of some of the things that uh, John had described. Uh, I want to provide some context on how homelessness impacts the community, specifically in context uh, to our public facilities, our, our parkades, our libraries, our, our theaters, our parks, the downtown core, uh, commercial areas, and then private and vacant property. Next, I want to uh, show how areas approximate to some of the intensive social and health services that are being provided, such as the OPS or SES, which are going to be spoken about later uh, today, may have some particular impacts or challenges. And then uh, finally, I want to illustrate uh, how some of, the, some of the challenges that our city staff face in managing uh, some of these impacts, i.e. the sheer volume of uh, garbage and debris that flows from it, uh, weapons, shopping carts, graffiti, and some of the things that uh, John had touched on earlier. So I want to touch on our public infrastructure first of all, and as it relates to our, our parkades and our conference center downtown. So you, you imagine when uh, folks come downtown and enjoy an evening at the Port Theatre or, or go to a, a, something in the conference center. If this is the, the ambassadorial reception they get into the, into the downtown core, it's very intimidating uh, for them. All these folks in themselves are, are usually relatively benign. When you go up a set of stairs to go get your vehicle and you encounter somebody that's in the use of uh, illicit drugs, it's very startling and intimidating for a lot of folks. And this is uh, the rationale for some of the recently enacted uh, bylaws, the public nuisance bylaws that were presented to you last week, addressing uh, people not uh, being in parkades uh, for unlawful uh, purposes. Uh, we do have a number of responses that, as well as the bylaws that you've enacted, in that we have a full-time eight-person police uh, bike patrol that work downtown almost exclusively, as well as a dedicated uh, downtown bylaw enforcement team, which uh, through funding is going to be increased from four to six members uh, this summer. And we also have uh, private security patrols 16 hours a day. I might add that uh, Council last year funded this for 24 hours a day, and when that, uh, some of the extra funding expired, that's now gone to 16 hours a day, so we do it from 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. daily. The reason is that we have to have a, a robust presence in, in our park age in particular is that these are high-impact areas for vehicle break-ins, uh, people, as you see here, obstructing access to the facilities, open drug use, aggressive soliciting and fan handling, and graffiti. And in the cold and climate weather like we've experienced recently, this is a very popular area for people to take shelter during climate weather. I just want to shift for a minute to our park uh, parkland areas and I just wanted to describe some of the what we talked about at the council meeting the other day about the conflicts of use and uh, why when we talked about uh, developed and undeveloped property and why we had 20 meter buffer areas 
where, where people can take shelter overnight from 7 p.m. to, to 9 a.m. Some of the photographs you see here are small uh, downtown parklets, particularly around some of our bus uh, stops. But they're left unmanaged as they were before had this bylaw enacted. We find that they can over time be entirely overtaken by, by the chattels and presence of, of the, the street homeless. Uh, Next slide over shows around some of our amenities. In this case, uh, up around the uh, some of the sites at the military museum, and then on the third one, around some of the um, public plazas that we have. So, by creating uh, these buffer areas, we we're hoping to reduce the conflict between the park users and the homeless that uh, take uh, shelters here. And again, it shows the the need for the recent amendments that, that we presented to you. Something that's becoming uh, increasingly challenged for, for our city staff are people that are living in vehicles, uh, not only in our parks, but in our streets. A phenomenon that we've seen more and more of uh, since Tent City is the rise of people that get uh, derelict motorhomes. And they often they don't have drivetrains or operating engines on them. They get them towed to different neighborhoods and they set up and, and they live out of them. Um, Sometimes it can be quite benign. We're finding more and more that the folks that are, are taking refuge in vehicles are tend to be elderly and, and handicapped. Uh, that sometimes makes it a bit of a challenging issue for enforcement staff. If somebody lives there and they don't have any other options, at what point do you tow them and impound them and, and deprive them of their property? Unfortunately, in other circumstances, we find that some of these vehicles are, are the sites for um, traffic and stolen property and drugs and, and uh, prostitution. Um, this problem has become so significant in the last couple of weeks, we find that our, our towing contractor did not have the capacity to tow and remove them. Every one of the tow compounds and the extra sites that they had rented were full, and a lot of it were the motorhomes and trailers that we've removed from the tent city and some of the other homeless sites. Uh, once we take possession, it becomes very expensive for the city and for our contractor because we have to get liens on them and eventually get them compacted. This often takes weeks or months and, and can involve thousands of uh, dollars. Uh, there are provincial laws and bylaws that address these type of issues, but in, in our case, I, I find they're, they're sadly out of date and, and, and need some uh, work. The other piece we have are the unmanaged camps in, in our green space. Uh, you've probably heard over time that our homeless counts have risen dramatically in recent years. The point in time count in uh, 2016 was 170 and then, then 18 months later went up to, to 335. Around the time of Tent City we thought the numbers were around uh, 500 or so. So it was a tendency by city and enforcement staff, people went to outline undeveloped unprogrammed areas and, and camped and stayed off the radar that we would kind of leave them alone and live and let live because essentially to rough them out of there we'd be pushing them from nothing uh, to nothing. Unfortunately when we ignore camps in undeveloped areas this is kind of the outcome of what we find. The environmental impacts, uh, the fire hazards and the filth and rubbish accumulations become overwhelming really quickly and those costs ultimately get pushed back to the municipality that we have to bring either our crews or, or contractors, and, and some of these cleanups cost us literally thousands uh, of dollars. As you can imagine, cities are complex places. Often the uh, public lands are contiguous with provincial lands, private properties, and, and utilities. We find that the rubbish and the camps flow from one to another, so we have to sort out uh, whose mess it is and who has to clean it up, and I can tell you that ultimately it's, it's usually ours. Um, Left uh, un unfettered for three, four, five weeks. This is what a, a typical uh, cleanup site uh, looks like. If it's in a park, it's our parks department. If it's uh, near a uh, city street, then it's our, our uh, uh, public works uh, department. And we're just spending thousands of dollars cleaning up this uh, type of uh, debris. If it falls on private property, we do have a uh, standards of maintenance uh, bylaw and and we have to pass this on to the property owners. But the reality is that a lot of our, our vacant open land belongs to people that don't even live in the, in the community. So we have to find out who they are, get a hold of them, and often arrange for contractors to do this on their behalf. And it's very, very time consuming for our staff. 
who does it ultimately fall on? Obviously, the city is, becomes the agency of uh, last resort. I can tell you that the sanitation department does a, an excellent job. They have a truck, I think it's called 415. It goes around and picks up these sites as, as they accumulate. But we find that they are so overtaxed that we often wait days before they're free to uh, come take debris off sites. And, and invariably, it's the uh, bylaw department that, that does it with their equipment, just because we want to free up, the, particularly the, the commercial streets and the downtown core quickly, so they're not looking at th this type of uh, debris. And these loads you're seeing, uh, that's the often you'll see two or three truckloads from from one uh, campsite to downtown. It be, can become uh, overwhelming very quickly. We'll pause for a minute to. Councilor Trille, I'm sure you can uh, empathize with uh, merchants who come to work in the morning and find encampments in their doorways. Uh, particularly during the inclement weather around uh, pre-tent city, it wouldn't be unusual for uh, our bylaw staff when we go out at 7 o'clock in the morning to the suites to find uh, encampments in 15 to 20 doorways in the morning. And, and part of the task that the, the police and the pilot department try to do is to clear this type of context before the merchants arrive and, and clear all the uh, debris away from there. This kind of led to the request last year for higher levels of service that we could have more of our sanitation and public work staff to clean the sidewalks, pressure wash, because with this you can imagine that there are a lot of uh, biological debris that's uh, left in behind here. But this is an ever-ending task for our staff to try to keep this context off the streets by the time that uh, emergents arrive in the morning for business. As I touched on earlier, uh, this isn't just a downtown phenomenon. We have a lot of open vacant uh, land throughout the community, a lot of vacant properties, and there's some discussion about what the impacts or efficacy of a, a vacant building by would be. But uh, again, in, in neighborhoods in the, in the south end, everywhere we're finding a lot of these cleanup sites and a, a lot of our work is just try, try to keep this uh, stuff clear. You've seen some of these photographs because I know they get emailed uh, to Maryland Council often, but if uh, we usually give owners two to three weeks notice to clean up and if, if they don't do it, we'll bring it, come in with contractors and do it for them. And this is the way they'll escalate just in the couple of weeks uh, of time before our crews come in. It's a perpetual problem once we clean up the sites, particularly if the uh, owners live in other cities, it starts repopulating with, with rubbish usually within days. I'm going to talk for a minute about um, intensive services. Uh, in this case, we're looking at Western Street in behind what's the current uh, OPS uh, site. It's a certain reality that, um, that the Street culture will often uh, accumulate or, or gather in undefended, unprotected areas. And this is what we call a, an urban dead zone. We have the Franklin Street Gym, which is a school district property. Uh, sadly, this was the uh, site of Tilcom Leyland's youth drop in center until a few months ago when it caught on fire. Now, likely was as a result of an encampment that was in the doorway. A fire started the door and spread up in, into the roof. Uh, making that building un uninhabitable. But uh, sadly, what we have here is an urban dead zone with an area uh, that the people on the street consider to be a, a safe use area. Our staff and, and myself, I'm out speaking with people every day that are smoking methamphetamine and fentanyl, and, and the question's always asked, why are you doing it here in front of a, a, a building with hundreds of people? And the response is, well, there's no safe place to do it, and you know, this is the safe consumption site, and this is where we feel safe. Uh, so when you have these uh, types of services, you have to have robust plans to uh, defend the uh, types of disorder that occur outside. And I can tell you that the service providers really robustly try to do it with program agreements, but often this type of uh, disorder requires a, a police and enforcement response. Closer up view of what the fallout is. This is the uh, side of the roadway on Wesley Street. And this is what the street looks like most mornings of every day, and particularly on the, on the weekends. 
a lot of the homelessness that you see there will actually move in under the uh, Sark building in the underhang where they're away in the, in the sheltered area. And I can tell you that our staff haul away truckloads of debris uh, every week. Our drains are uh, clogged with uh, harm reduction supplies. And here's what you see is when I refer to an urban dead zone, you get the graffiti, uh, the, the litter, and it's just uh, something that's very perpetual and, and very difficult for us. Needles are, are an ever-pressing uh, part of this context. I can tell you that we had a long meeting this morning with uh, many of our service providers and, and VHA. And there are many robust cleanup strategies that are in place to, to uh, mitigate these challenges. Uh, but it's a certain reality too that discarded needles are one of the main aversions to any services that have any correlation to, to addiction in our community. And we just, our dialogue show, indicates that we just have to do more and more to be proactive to uh, handle this issue. The other part of this context that uh, is inevitable for us is uh, the weapons that are out on, on the street. Uh, the bylaw officers that work in Nanaimo don't have any defensive tools. They don't wear vests. They don't carry aerosols or batons. So at this point, uh, my teams have to work in a minimum of pairs when they go out and uh, deal with these encampments, which they're doing uh, all day long. In the larger camps, like some of the photographs you saw, it will often require also policing and assistance. Uh, and for the same reason, that's why police and bylaw services often have to accompany our parks and sanitation staff when they work in, in these types of uh, environments. So what you can see is that we need a, a layered uh, municipal response, uh, policing and enforcement. But it, really goes to the heart of why it's important that we have housing opportunities and, and, and different options for folks to get them off the street. A lot of the responses that are highlighted here are things that are built in the framework of the uh, Homeless Action Plan, and I, I think that you guys will be speaking a bit more on that, so I won't go into that in any detail. So I'll stop there and just open it to any questions you have for me. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, thank you, uh, Mr. LeBerge. Uh, a little depressing, but very informative. Uh, so, first of all, thank you to you and your staff for the, for the work that you do. Um, aside from the sympathy I feel for people who are genuinely homeless and wishing to find shelter, I have as much sympathy for the merchants and the citizens that have to face some of those scenes that you just showed us. Uh, so, a couple of questions: If if a resident observes um, an unmanaged campsite or uh, an unplated vehicle uh, parked in a, in a residential area which is apparently being used for homelessness, should they contact bylaw? Is that the, the route to go? How should we approach this? Yeah, through the chair, that, that's correct. Bylaw services or the uh, public works number will dispatch uh, those resources. And one thing I can tell you that we're doing now is uh, there's a new outreach team that's been funded by BC Housing uh, and we are trying to coordinate the response to these encampments with both the police, uh, city bylaw and outreach component. The whole idea is that we can identify folks and refer them to housing and shelter opportunities as they arise rather than just having the enforcement response to, to remove. So we're trying to balance both those competing interests. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Gesselberg. Uh, through the chair, I'm just curious how has that, that collaboration been, been going so far in coordinating with BC Housing to have both uh, show up to these sites? Is that something that is proving? through the chair it's a very good question this actually isn't uh, something new the uh, relationship between enforcement and uh, outreach has been going on for over a, a decade a lot of this work was done previously with the uh, homeless outreach team which is a, a VHA team that work continues this is just a new team uh, that's been funded since uh, the, the tent city uh, and the idea is moving towards a centralized intake, meaning that there's one body that identifies the scope of homeless and homelessness in the community and uh, 
builds kind of one list, does a vulnerability assessment, and then is a point of referral. So it's just yet a, another layer or a new outreach team that's going above the, the work that's been done in, in the past. So those relationships are there. Uh, it work, works very well, and we're, we're looking forward just to, to having this extra tool. Mm -hmm. right. Follow up on that. Is that uh, the centralized intake? Um, is that something that we're going to speak a bit uh, at some point more on the not specifically to that, we could touch on it if you like. That would be great, please. Yeah. Councilor Shirley. Thank you, uh, to Mr. Rivers, um, after Professor, somewhat ignorant of this stuff. Um, so the, the um, SCS is on Wesley Street, the picture you showed behind the gym there. I thought, my understanding is there's a building there that I thought had a safe consumption site inside the building. Am I not correct there? <coughs> Through the chair, you are correct. It, it, specific language: What it exists in the Wesley Street building presently is an overdose prevention site, which is uh, uh, funded and placed by the health authority under the provincial uh, emergency. The idea of a uh, supervised consumption site—that's a federally licensed facility. And a, Comes with a more robust suite of services and funding. It would be bigger, better staffed, have more space. I think a lot of the challenge that you see is exists right now is the scope and scale of the service they can provide with an OPS. Uh, there's no waiting areas for, for people that, that want to go in, use the facility, or remain afterwards. So they, they come in and they kind of get shepherded back out on the street. The hope or the expectation of a, an SCS is that there would be more space and more supervision so a lot of those activities and a lot of the, the clients would, would remain inside rather than being on the street. Paul, is there any funding on the horizon? Thank you. Federal government to go that route? I believe the presentation by Dr. Hasselback is going to speak to the intention of, of the health authority to to move from an OTS to an SES site in the city. Councillor Chairman, pardon me, Councillor Thor. Thank you, Your Worship. Something else just occurred to me that I wanted to ask about because we've had for, I think, a couple of years now discussions uh, kicking around the, the future of what used to be the community uh, policing building on Victoria Crescent. And of course, this problem is, is citywide from, from south to north, but just thinking about the downtown area, uh, has there been any more thought given to a future use for that building as, a, as an outreach, outreach uh, center slash bylaws, light patrol headquarters? Uh, are those stock talks still happening, or where are we at with that building, I guess is what I'm asking. To the chair, to Councillor. Thorpe. That, that's a very good and pressing question. It's been revisited a number of times, and the reality is that there isn't any efficacy of locating enforcement and outreach or harm reduction in the same uh, workspace from the perspective that the clients will not go and, and engage with outreach if there's an enforcement presence. There's also overarching privacy issues. Uh, outreach often deals with medical diagnosis and, and they have overarching privacy uh, issues. So you can't collectively put those services out of the same work site. It's, it certainly works very well for those teams to go out into the community to site together, uh, but the co-shared work sites just are not successful. We've looked at many different models and, and we don't really see anything that would be workable as, as far as trying to broaden the use of the community services offices as, as it exists. That being the case as, a, as it's in close proximity to City Hall, uh, the determination is whether we could maybe move that staff up to City Hall and then use the, the money for the rent for you know, more specific uh, services uh, is maybe where the, the dialogue is, has been going uh, lately. So, in other words, we're still determining the fate of, of that building, whether it's usable or not. 
that is correct, but we were probably moving more towards a model of uh, bringing the bylaw team up and, and combining the, the team that works out of the Sark building with the team that works downtown so we can uh, kind of cross-pollinate and have them working more in unity and then re repurposing that building for something else. Anyone else? Worship, just on the supervised consumption site issue, for back to Councillor Turley's question, I think there's, I think Council would do well to be very informed on the terminology that's being used around these different facilities. <coughs> the supervised consumption site, until within the last couple of years, there was only one in North America. That was the one on East Hastings, called Insight. And uh, it's only been recently, primarily, I think, in response to the fentanyl crisis. And Dr. Hasselbeck can certainly correct me, and we'll speak way better about this. <coughs> this uh, has been a game changer on the whole narrative, and and now I think you've seen uh, a few in the past 18 months or two years uh, pop up in Victoria and Vancouver and other locations. So it's now become more acceptable and mainstream, and there's issues around that, uh, the acceptance in the community, about what it is and why, and I mean the same issues existed years ago, just on, not that long ago, about the dissemination of harm reduction supplies in some places, and not really embracing that, uh, even certain institutions in the business of <coughs> managing homeless people. I'll use the Salvation Army as an example, philosophically did not uh, allow for the dissemination of harm reduction supplies philosophically. So there's, there's a lot of things, so I think uh, and that part of today is just to get things on the table, get, so start to familiarize ourselves, because that is a big step up to go into a supervised consumption and zoning issues. We're going to speak to that today. And, uh, and, and, and that's what, why we're here today, is just to try to make sure that we're, you're as informed as possible moving forward. And, and, uh, so I, I just wanted to say that about that one particular item. Right. I did want to give you some sense of what we're currently doing, what our responses have been, and what we're doing today. But I wanted to add one piece of narrative around the supervised overdose prevention site in Wesley Street. There's been public disorder on Wesley Street for many years, well before the OPS came along. It's because you have a huge abandoned school, there's lots of nooks and crannies, there's no overlook. That site has been attracting nuisance properties, nuisance behaviors for many years. The second piece says, in an over, uh, overdose prevention site supervised consumption service, there's no provision made for the smoking inhalation of illicit substances because under WorkSafe, we can't have smoking in the building. So anyone who smokes, and that's traditionally been a lower quantity, but now it's becoming more popular because it's way easier to control the dosage. So people who want to smoke will come to that area because they're in the vicinity of the OPS. If they go over, they know that there's trained professionals right there who can perhaps come and revive them. So there's a whole piece that flows into that, and additionally, they would gather there if there was an OPS or not because it's that kind of site. So I just wanted to say that drawing a causal line between the OPS and the public disorder in Wesley is probably a lot more complex than it might look to some citizens. So just wanted to make sure that that was in your head soon. I did want to touch on our responses. What we do, um, Mr. LaBerge has touched on the bylaw response, but as you know, we often balance our bylaw response, our enforcement response with our social response. So this is a list of things we've sort of done in the past. We've sponsored supportive housing. We all know about that. We've done funding for emergency shelters. We provide money uh, every year to the extreme weather shelter, and we provide money for the shower program. We do rent supplements as part of the Housing First Initiative through the John Howard Society. We do an urban cleanup program to deal with the disorder, the garbage, the needles. We, um, we have the safe needle disposal boxes all over our city. We, have, um, we allocate $85,000 a year under the social development grants, or social grant programs. We provide leadership that's often our role to go into rooms and foster collaboration. We support our nonprofit partners, the people who do the heavy lifting on these files. And uh, we provide a space for meal programs and for other city uh, sponsored. Well, we provide city space for, for a variety of things that, that address these issues. But 
Here's what I wanted to give you is today, as we stand here, this is what you're currently funding us to do. We have our urban cleanup program, that's the John Howard, three days a week. They're out there with their peers doing the pickup of garbage and needles. We have a shower program at Caledonia, and that sees about seven to 15 people a day who go there for showers five days a week. We have the rent supplements we provide. There's not a timeline associated with that. When the money runs out, the money runs out. We have our 10 additional dental boxes that council approved last year, which are gonna be going up this year. Uh, there's a provision for a drop-in space of $100,000 per annum. That's on today's agenda for further discussion. And then we have our annual contribution to the Extreme Weather Shelter, which we've been doing since it, oh, probably about five or six years now. So those are the current, where we're doing, what we're spending it on, and uh, what kind of activities we're currently finding that might be considered more of a social response than a, an enforcement response. The other piece to know is we have a lot of places we go in and work with the team and the community on these topics. We have all sorts of collaborative structures, enough to make your head spin. You've got homeless coalitions that we sit on. We sit on a sober and assessment center, which is up on the uh, by the hospital for people that are too inebriated and need to go sober up. We have community health network that's functioning right now, and that's looking at a really systemic response to these issues. We're on community action teams for the overdose response, um, community advisory committees for the two uh, sites at Labio and Terminal. We have a housing first committee that we're part of. We have good neighbor processes that we attend regularly. We sit on nuisance properties. We have a sex trade cohort that takes action. We have a collaborative services committee with the medical profession. There's many others, but this gives you a bit of a laundry list to tell you that there's a lot of structures and things in our community that set out to tackle these problems day in and day out, and we're vigorously participating in all those. We have a bunch of partners we do it with. Uh, I'm not going to lead you the laundry list. There's quite an extensive uh, group of people. You'll notice, of course, that Island Health is at the top of that. There are key partners. When we're looking at physical and mental wellness, they are the body whose jurisdiction this is, who are legislatively enabled to, to tackle these things and funded to do so. There are key partners when it comes to mental health and addictions. Mr. Horn, as a matter of practice, the, it's a long list of community partners and one can understand just by the nature of their names and titles why they're all involved. How, do, how does it get coordinated per se, or does it get coordinated? Is there a, are there regular meetings? Is there a newsletter? Or is there simply ongoing consultation from time to time? Is there some organizational structure to communication, cooperation? Yes, many of these are monthly meetings. The Homeless Coalition has been meeting monthly since 2004, so well over a decade. Many of the people on that coalition also are part of these other structures. There's a lot of crossing over. For example, the Poor Island Health Authority folks have to attend just about every meeting that moves, you know. But there's a second piece of that, really, is that when we're doing this, we're often coming at it from a subject-specific or a topic-specific way. So if we're addressing homelessness, we're crossing over all the jurisdictions that deal with that topic. So while the structures may look like they're silos, typically we're crossing a lot of boundaries and we really focus on the topic at hand. Sex trade cohort may have many of the members that sit on the coalition, but we're focused on the sex trade and we make sure that everyone who has a piece of that puzzle is in the room and the work is coordinated. So a lot of the goals of these structures and processes is for frontline service providers and the people who make funding decisions and the people who drive strategic plans, that they're all at the table in the same place at the same time. So all that lines up. So that's really key for us. We need our frontline service providers to feed up to us what's going on in the streets and what's the context. And for those who implement and, and resource programs and services, for them to understand here's what we need to do next. So there's a lot of that coordination happens and it is, you know, for the average citizen, probably a bit bewildering. Who are all these people? Why do they meet? Do they talk to each other? Pretty much every day of every week, we speak across these committees and through and between these committees. So um, I'd give the short answer, which is yes. Much of this work is around coordinating our activities. The is pretty good at that. I've been to communities where they don't talk to each other. Here we do a lot of that. We're just big enough to have a lot of things going on, but small enough that we all know each other. If you go to Vancouver, there's too much to keep track of. There just is. We're just the right size. We can do a lot, and we can still track and coordinate it all amongst ourselves. So. Um, and if I may, through the chair, I know Council Bressel, but you had a question earlier. I think I, I said I would bring it up. And um, well, regarding the uh, coordinated intake or the, I have the coordinated access. Coordinated access. Yeah, just so as part of the new funding that's coming through from the federal government, 
and through BC Housing. Everyone's focused now. Not only are we taking a housing first approach to homelessness and these issues, but now we're taking a coordinated access approach, which means that anyone who presents to the system at any door, at any agency, typically what happens is that agency decides that person needs housing. And then they come into these structures and processes and they advocate for that person. And can happen sometimes is that the person with the best advocate ends up with the resources. And we all know the syndrome of the person with the best lawyer wins the court case. It's similarly in this way. If you have a great advocate, then some doors begin to open. If you don't, and you're disconnected from the system, then it's hard. There's no one in there pushing for your case, right? So what we're looking at across the country, uh, and particularly here in the NAMO, is we move forward with federal funding. They're requiring this, and so is BC Housing requiring, that we actually collect our pool of potential uh, candidates for housing and services, <coughs> that we have a comprehensive way of looking at those folks in an in a objective way of determining who should go into which housing project, who should get that service, right? Because there's more demand than there is supply. So really managing that in a strategic and coordinated way is the next step for us as a community. And both our federal and provincial funding partners are insisting that we proceed down that road on that basis. So we'll be, as we're speaking, working on what does that look like in the Nanaimo? Because in other communities, they have separate systems. But here, we're just working out logistically how we're going to make sure we do that in accordance with our funders' wishes, but also because it's now best practice. So, to the chair, to follow up on that, what that process of implementing the coordinated access and accessing the funding currently, what desk is that sitting on, and, and what group of people are uh, involved in executing the implementation of this? Thank you. And through the chair to Council Besenberg. The main body where that's going to land is the, the Nanaimo Homeless Coalition, because that's where the overall coordination and all this is going to go. There'll be various sub-tables, for example, people who have contracts with BC Housing to provide supportive housing. You're going to have to work that out with their funder, BC Housing. But generally, that conversation is going to be happening at the coalition, and partly because the federal government, in the renewal of their funding to Nanaimo for the next 10 years, is saying to us, that has to happen as part of this renewal of funding. So they give us uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year to help us with homelessness, and that's now the condition going forward. So that'll be the main group, and it'll be the topic of lots of sub-areas, if you will, but the Homeless Coalition is gonna be where that lands, and we'll really work that out between us all. So the chair, one more question, if I may. Um, is this coordinated access going to improve our data uh, collection and, and management of, you know, just numbers, locate where folks are from, you know, what type of services that they, they need. Like, is, is it going to allow integrated data management of, of services? Yes, and that's one of the goals of the Coordinated Access Center, or systems that they're using across the country. Some places, for example, take a by name list. They actually identify by name everyone in their community who doesn't have a place to live. And every week they come forward with that list and they go, What's happened to Jane? Where's Bob? Where's Phil's case? You know, so they do it by nameless. That's one way of making sure that you're not leaving anybody out. But it definitely gives you a more robust picture. And that's some of that funding that we referred to earlier that Canadian Mental Health Association has. They'll be going out into the community to identify who is it that's out there in our parks, in the uh, private lands that are uh, you know, sort of neglected private lands, if you will, and really ascertaining who's out there and exactly what do they need. And that really is gonna inform that coordinated access process. And so right now, the way we do it is really by agency. Here's my clients, here's my client list. But there's a whole bunch of folks who don't fit into any agency, who don't connect with anybody, and we really wanna capture them. So it'll give us a better picture, and a more what we want is a real-time analysis, almost on a daily basis. How many people do we have who are unhoused in our community? Where are they and what are their situations? And that's what one of the goals we're moving towards, a much more robust and fine-grained analysis of that. Great. Thank you. Councillor Marvin. Thank you. Um, through the chair, um, a question. I think it is Harris House, but I'm trying to understand the safe consumption and the overdose, etc. Don't we have a safe consumption here in Orlando? I'll refer to Dr. Hasselbeck, but I can tell you this, that we have an overdose prevention site, which is enabled under the provincial declaration of a public health emergency. So it's enabled under a specific emergency legislation, and as such, 
if the provincial government deemed it no longer an emergency, they would no longer have that ability to operate at that site. But it is an overdose prevention site, not a supervised consumption service. And Dr. Hasselbeck is way smarter than me. <laughs> he went to med school, but he'll explain that. Harris House is a health center and they provide harm reduction supplies, including, say, clean syringes, right? But they're essentially a health service, right. wound treatment, counseling, they have a couple of nurses on staff. Right. They'll hand out condoms, needles, things that keep people safe. Right. But they are not a place where you can consume oh, okay. substances. So that's the difference. Thank you. So that's given you an overview of all the municipal response to health and social issues, what we're doing now, what we've traditionally done. Um, and that leads us down the road to some of these topics. And uh, my goal here was today was to set you a bit of a stage so you know the context in which these subsequent discussions are gonna happen. But for the supervised consumption service, I'm gonna uh, provide the baton, if you will, to my colleague, Karen Conson, and I think Dr. Hasselbeck will also be speaking on um, these topics. If I may, though, I'm just going to ask any further questions? Uh, for a motion with respect to municipal response to health and social issues. To receive. Second. To receive. Second. Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Ms. Cronstall. Thank you. So my yeah. name is Karen Cronstall, social planner as well as with John. I'm going to talk today a little bit by way of an introduction to Dr. Hasselbeck's presentation about the municipal role in uh, the siting of supervised consumption services. So I don't want to go over the same ground three times. Uh, Dr. Hasselbeck is going to provide more of an introduction to the difference between a supervised consumption service and what we have right now in overdose prevention site. But just to um, make you all aware that both are harm reduction services where individuals can consume substances to be, to be opiate based under the supervision of trained staff. Uh, we'll intervene in the event of an overdose, but as you've heard already, and we'll hear more about, the level of service that's available at a supervised consumption service is much greater, and it also requires an uh, application to the federal government for an exemption through to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So an overdose prevention site, which again we've had a little over two years at 437 Wesley Street, is a facility that is meant to address an immediate concern and is established under an emergency order. Dr. Hasselbeck is going to show you a more detailed timeline, but just to give you a high-level overview, in December 2014, Nanaimo had its first overdose prevention working group formed. In April of 2016, BC declared a public health emergency in regards to the opiate uh, overdoses. In January of 2017, the first overdose prevention site was opened just behind us at 437 Wesley Street. Um, it has a city lease as the land underneath the building is owned by the city and had support and principal from council. In May of 2017, there was a uh, rezoning application from the city uh, on behalf of Island Health for a site-specific rezoning. We're going to discuss why that was required to uh, make an application for a supervised consumption site, which was denied at the public hearing. And just most recently, in February of 2018, a community action team was established in Nanaimo with one-time funding of $100,000 to do a variety of um, harm reduction activities in the community. So what is the new, so this, the sort of theme today is, um, it's not necessarily our jurisdiction, but it's definitely our problem or our issue to deal with. And what is our role as a municipal government in the siting of such a service? Because obviously, Dr. Hasselbeck is gonna to speak to the siting criteria that Island Health looks at when they're selecting a site for a supervised consumption service application. We have two roles as a municipal government. One of them is under the legislation we're operating in, there is the Respect for Communities Act, which is an amendment to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which speaks to the need for community input, input from the local government for this application. So that can come in the form of a letter of support or a letter of support with conditions or a letter of no comment, but there needs to be local government input into the application. And Dr. Hasselbeck can probably speak more in more detail to the nature of the application since he's actually been the one filling it out for several years. The second aspect of this is the underlying land use zoning, which is not actually, a, I believe, a part of the application itself, but a concern to us. What is the zoning of this use? So we've looked at, I think you have an attachment to your report, um, looking at how different municipalities have solved this question of zoning in regards to supervised consumption services. Different places have taken, taken different approaches. In Nanaimo, we are held to our current zoning um, 
we have a definition in our zoning bylaw already which captures or speaks to the supervised consumption service use. It is drug addiction treatment facility. It was introduced in our, into our zoning bylaw in 2006 as part of a suite of different amendments to the zoning bylaw that sought to introduce new definitions for different types of social service uses with different allowances as far as how uh, where they were allowed in the community. So there's social service centre, which is more of an office use, which is allowed in a lot of different parts in the community. There's social service resource centre, which is a more intensive use, more like a drop-in centre kind of thing, which is allowed in fewer parts of the community. And they also, at that time, introduced drug addiction treatment facility, which is a use which captures things like safe injection sites. As uh, Jake alluded, there was at the time only the one in Canada at Insight but it was introduced into the zoning bylaw. And so when the rezoning application was made in 2017, there was a new definition that was proposed that was spoke more specifically to supervised consumption service, but recognized that with this use in the zoning bylaw, because it's defined in the zoning bylaw, but not allowed by right anywhere, any new drug addiction treatment facility required a site-specific rezoning. So that is how we came to the point of requiring a rezoning for a supervised consumption service. And that is where we stand today as far as the zoning situation goes. We didn't make any changes to the definitions at that time when the public hearing um, didn't was not approved. There was a number of motions that were made at that time in regards to different approaches to health and social services in the community, which many of the responses we've already heard about today came from. But changes to the zoning bylaw was not one of the responses. So we have some options for moving forward, and this is just, I want to stress, just two broad options. We could also look at variations on each option, but basically they come down to status quo, where supervised consumption service is a site-specific use, and that could come with amendments to the zoning bylaw to change the definitions, recognizing that it's pretty archaic by today's standards the way the drug addiction treatment facility is defined, and those terms are not even really used in the health profession in the same way now but we could approach it from a site-specific way. Or secondly, as many other communities have treated as a health service, so it is considered to fall under um, something like medical office, in which case it would be allowed, the zoning would allow it in many places, but it would still require a federal exemption for every site. So that second part of the local government input is the same regardless of how it's treated in the zoning. But you get, then you wouldn't have to rezone for each site if in the future there was a second site identified at a different health area, um, as long as it did, if, the, if it, the second option was pursued, then you would just be dealing with the federal exemption, you wouldn't be dealing with the rezoning application. Is is that clear? Maybe I'll pause here and see some you know, fairly... Also, Bonnie, so if if you're going with option two, thank you, Worship, for your two words. So, um, if you're going with option two, then one of these sites could be set up tomorrow uh, without any public input? No. Through the chair, no. You would still require the federal exemption uh, that for the supervised consumption service would still require, need to go through the whole federal exemption process. So only the question of zoning would be allowed. The local government input would still be required for every single site. Yes. Councillor Gasselbrock, uh, through the chair, just option two, you would require a public hearing. Um, through the chair, you wouldn't require, you would require a public hearing for the initial change of allowing it in medical office, but then going forward, you wouldn't require a public hearing for it. If there was indeed an application for more than one site, as you know, cities much larger than Nanaimo only maybe have two sites like Victoria. So it may be the case there's really only one for the foreseeable future. And that's a question best answered by Dr. Hasselbeck when he comes to the podium. But the, the, there would be a public hearing, but only for the initial change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what would be the requirements for the federal uh, licensing? Um, is there any public input on that or is it just something they apply for? Uh, to the chair? Yes, there is a component under the Respect for Communities Act for local input and that's something we would work with the health authority on putting together some sort of a public engagement plan for that. Ultimately the support our letter is given by council. So as we're going to see there's different um, approaches well, I don't know if this speaks to it specifically in terms of what that little level letter of support can look like. It can have conditions attached which come out of the public engagement and there's also the option of creating citing criteria as I think there's an example in your agenda from London, Ontario where they created citing criteria not dissimilar to that for liquor rezonings where you look at proximity to various uses. So we're just going to walk through a couple of municipalities. Um, Certainly there's many different ways to approach such a thing. Victoria, they have two zoning bylaws in Victoria, so this speaks to the downtown zoning. 
um, but both of the supervised consumption services are in the downtown, so they consider it part of health services in that case. And uh, it's guided sort of by their five pillar harm reduction policy, which they've had for I believe, eight years in Victoria. And this is the case also in Kelowna and Kamloops and speaking to staff there. Uh, even though they actually have sites that alternate between two sites, it's next to health clinics. In one case, I think in the parking lot, in the other case right beside it. And they're considering it as part of the health service. And there was public input in both those cases, but not a public hearing. So this is London, Ontario. This is happening in real time. They chose to add specific definitions for both supervised consumption service and overdose prevention site to the zoning bylaw. They developed the siting criteria, which you have in your agendas. And then they worked with the health authority to identify two possible sites. They've rezoned one of them. I believe the second one is still um, in process. And they have been doing public engagement or dialogue around this discussion for the whole of 2018. So this goes back to the question of the federal application. Um, again, Dr. Hasbach will speak more clearly to what is required under the federal application, but local government support or the option of no comment um, is, but there needs to be local government input for the application to be considered complete. And if you go on the federal website, you'll see there's a number of applications in process and you'll see the areas in which they're considered to be complete or incomplete. And consultation is one of them. And I believe the last bullet has to do with the citing criteria. So th this is where I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hasselbeck, but we'll just pause to see if there's any questions around the municipal role. Councillor Chirley. Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, so two questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, uh, on these existing SESs in Victoria and London, is there kind of data collected on the number of people that actually go there to, to use it? And, and the second question is, has there been any significant reduction in discarded needles throughout the community as a result of these facilities? Uh, through the chair. I don't have those statistics. I know they do collect statistics um, and we can get them for you. I don't have them in front of me today, but yes. We, you know, it was very interesting at our needle meeting this morning, we had the folks from Harris House here because we were talking about needles in, needles out, and they collect nearly 100% as many needles in as they hand out. I think you see, but with it, 98%. So we know that there is a lot of needles coming back to the people who give them out, but getting the numbers on those things is. And perhaps Dr. Hasbach may have some information to share on that topic as well. Anything further, Ms. Cronston? Not for me right now. Thank but you very much. I'll turn it over to the, the Dr. doctor. Welcome. Thank you. Just make sure the technology is working. Worship members of uh, the committee and uh, your administration and your guest today. Thanks very much for having me. A lot of your questions, hopefully, I will be able to answer. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to come to you and tell you what my job is. And I just wanted, a, in a short view, I work as much for you as I do for Island Health as I do for the citizens of this community. So I'm not here presenting a position of Island Health. I'm here to talk to you about the issue of consumption here in Nanaimo and the opioid crisis, and I've actually called it a bit of an update. Um, we can talk about the specifics relative to supervised consumption and details on that, but that's not the only thing that prompted me to sort of say we've got to get here. The crisis here began uh, back in 2013, so this isn't something new. At that point in time, Nanaimo had a unique situation with its zoning bylaw where it required site-specific zoning for what is known as a drug addiction treatment facility. I'm putting that out there because that was unique. We're in the status quo, it hasn't changed. And that's part of the conversation that needs to be undertaken at this point in time about how do we move forward uh, bringing Nanaimo in line with what's happening in other communities where siting is an important component um, but shouldn't be a, necessarily a barrier to providing a, a necessary health service. I provided a, a long list up there of activities and there's been lots of engagement with previous council. Uh, committees. Uh, we've gone through a process for siting and site-specific zoning application for one particular location, which uh, went through the whole of the supervised consumption consultation process and was basically ignored Okay, at a public hearing in front of council. 
the good news. This is our overdose crisis here in Nanaimo. And, yeah, let's see if I... Oh, I pressed the wrong button. I was trying to get a laser. There it is. Thank you. You will notice I said 2013. In 2013, the background levels here are the island and BC, and they're almost on top of each other. So the rate increase that happened in the, um, the island and BC is being very comparable. If you take a look at Nanaimo, though, Nanaimo got hit early, got hit harder, and certainly peaked at a level which is fairly comparable even to some of the lower mainland areas that uh, we get a lot of attention. What is unique? is this very substantive reduction that we've seen in the last year. Okay. It's brought us back to average. Okay. For those that believe in the regression to the mean, perhaps that's what's occurred. For those who believe that um, our services are actually working, that's a good thing as well. Um, we may actually just be following an outbreak curve. We started early. Uh, those that are most susceptible have already succumbed, unfortunately. And during this time, we have lost in a neighborhood of 150 individuals who are neighbors, friends, um, colleagues uh, within this community. And since this discussion began on the zoning bylaw, which was actually in January of 2017, we've lost 90 additional individuals. Not that that would change necessarily, but I did want to put it in context. This is still a crisis and it's an ongoing crisis. So how big is the problem? And I want to do, I do want to put Nanaimo in the context, and I apologize for sometimes numbers and weights. Uh, if you're looking for clarification, please don't hesitate to ask. Our best estimate at this point in time is we have about 2,300 people in our community who are uh, under the categorization of an opioid or a substance use disorder, an opioid use disorder. Of that, roughly half of them are regular or injection users. Um, we also have a f about 35% that are currently in recovery. And I say currently because this is a chronic relapsing illness. Okay, the fact that we've got a third or 35% currently engaged in active treatment uh, is a real plus and a significant increase from two years ago. Okay, this is not the only room where this conversation is occurring about how are we going to address the overdose crisis in Nanaimo. And I think we've made more success in other settings. <laughs> okay, that's probably related to why we've seen some of that decrease. And this is one of the areas where we've seen significant improvements. We can look at a rate, so it gives us a sense of what do we know about how well are we doing with the treatment? And we're about 50% higher than the province, generally speaking, in terms of the rate of people within our community that are in treatment. Turns out we were actually higher than about that when we started. So we've, we've grown, we've grown well, we've been done a fairly good job of engaging individuals, but we still have about two thirds of those individuals who have an opioid substance use disorder who require um, who we probably would like to be reaching out more in terms of providing additional supports. And what those supports look like is now compromised by the existing definition of a drug addiction treatment facility in the zoning bylaw, which council is responsible for. Also wanted to put this in context because when we talk about substances, we tend to forget about these two substances. But alcohol rates, uh, 120 to 150 per thousand. And I will be talking more about how alcohol is becoming an even greater problem and should always be seen as a greater problem than our opioid um, uh, treatment, uh, our opioid issues. And put it in context that that's actually become greater than our nicotine substance use or tobacco consumption issues. Okay, yeah, times are changing and with that, we need to modernize our overall approaches. Okay, so we can't depend upon decisions that were made around 2003, 2004. Not that this is a great slide, but I did use it four years ago. And I said, if we're going to grapple this OPA crisis, we need to be looking at each one of these boxes separately. 
Okay. And that goes from our prevention components into our treatment, getting people to treatment, uh, certainly the recovery components where housing is important, but it's not the only component of housing. We need more community supports. We need to have um, our, something that individuals who are in recovery actually get up for and look forward to during the day. Okay, we've got lots of challenges ahead of us. Okay. Down here, you're going to see harm reduction, naloxone, and supervised consumption. That's probably as far as we're going to talk today. But I do share this because I, I've, I've lightened up those boxes where I think that there's significant progress that's being made and those that are darker ones where I don't think that we've made a lot of progress. Just to say there's a lot of work that has been done. In no area, except perhaps in the naloxone distribution, do I think we're even close to what level of intervention is required to fully grapple with this crisis. Okay. We've done really well on the naloxone distribution component, so it's one that perhaps is the most successful of the interventions. You had some questions about overdose prevention sites, supervised consumption sites, and your questions are based upon what's happened in the past and where things are today. I think the challenge that I put out there is, can you project what's going to happen in the future? Okay. Um, I don't think five years ago people in this room actually thought cannabis legalization was actually going to happen. Okay. Um, certainly five years ago no one even talked about legalization of other substances. And yet that's on the table as part of the drug policy reforms. I think that we're at a point where overdose prevention sites which are established as part of this crisis that BC has been grappling with and under a ministerial directive, uh, it provides certain authorities and responsibilities but really is just a safe room where people can come to consume a substance and should they have an overdose somebody can respond. That's all an overdose prevention site is. Now we try to make a little bit more than that, but I just want to stress that that's all it is. There's nothing about a therapeutic component. We try to be sure that if an individual shows up and says, hey, I want to, you know, my time is now that I'd like to get some treatment to see what we can do to support them. And I think some of our sites do okay, some do better than okay, and some don't do, do so well. But we have nine sites across uh, Vancouver Island. Only two of them have that designation as supervised consumption site, which is an exemption to the Controlled Substances Act. It's the only major difference. In order to get that exemption, what it allows for is the possession of a controlled substance without it being considered illicit at that point in time. Okay, so it's not about a Health Canada approval for a supervised consumption site. It's actually an application for an exemption to Section 56.1 of the Controlled Substances Act so that substances can be consumed without it being considered an illicit activity. Okay. That is the major difference, but it's also a challenge for overdose prevention sites which are established under an emergency order in case should we get to a point where that order is lifted, overdose prevention sites wouldn't be sustained. Okay. No one's thinking that's going to happen, but I'm encouraging you to think, well, maybe we're starting to see the downturn. Okay, we certainly saw BC that things didn't go up last year for the first time. Okay. There is an end to this in some fashion, we just don't know how long it's going to take to get there. But consumption will continue. Okay. Um, there are other, as part of the application for an exemption to Section 56.1, there are some very specific requirements. I think that what you look at very much is based upon what was called the Respect for Communities Act that was brought in by the Harper government. Probably a little bit more conservative and probably fairly restrictive. It's one of the reasons that for a whole decade there was only one supervised consumption site in the country. 
As the crisis came along and there were changes to the Act, it became a little bit easier to progress. So we're up into the several dozen supervised consumption sites across the country. Um, some of that application process is actually fairly difficult. <laughs> okay. And some of the costs associated with a supervised consumption site beg some questions, but at least some of us here in Nanaimo still think it's a valuable con additive to the suite of services that are needed in this particular community, given the number of individuals who are currently consuming. You asked about needle cleanup. Well, there's only one good evaluation that's occurred, and that happened in the uh, Insight location in Vancouver. So th I think we're still learning an awful lot. But in that evaluation, the, the establishment of the, the insight actually led to a reduction in sharps and uh, public consumption in and around the area of that particular site. And I stress that's one site that's being evaluated. There are several hundred across globally. It is becoming a, a normal health service on an international basis. None has been as researched as much as insight. So if we want to take a look at what was learned, it's a good document to take a good look at. And I, I almost encourage you to do that because it was actually released under a fairly conservative political party. Okay. And those that are a little bit more engaged with that particular site would say that it was filtered substantively, and yet it still demonstrates the value of the supervised consumption site. Okay. So hence, it's being recognized, it's being recognized in the Supreme Court legally that supervised consumption is a health, health service, it's not a social service, if you want to put it in that context. One of the reasons why I'm here. some questions on where does this get cited and here's one of the challenges okay it's like any other business it's got to go into a location I've sat with people who've been around this table before and they say well we want you to try this site and we want you to try that site and I say forget that okay I don't know today what would be an appropriate location because some of it's got to do with market availability um, a whole bunch of factors involved um, cost. <laughs> okay. What services can be provided? Okay. Are we only looking at one site? Okay. I don't have answers to you on those questions. Okay. I only put this up here to suggest to you that there's more to that decision-making process and it is not a political process on the actual site. So we have a real conflict in Nanaimo where there's an insistence on a site-specific zoning which is a political decision, and the decision to go ahead with the supervised consumption. Until that issue is resolved, we will not move forward with an application for a su supervised consumption site. And I'm being so blunt as to say resolved with the elimination of the site-specific zoning. That does not mean that it shouldn't be channeled in a certain areas. <laughs> okay. What we've seen in other communities is that they're trying to define what does that look like. It's a health service, okay? So health services, that's quite appropriate. Not a problem. We'll work with that. We have to comply in terms of the siting. This is the only community where I'm aware where we have a site-specific barrier in place, which is why we're not proceeding at this point. One of those criteria really does come down to location, okay? And I have some maps, and I can pull them up afterwards if you really want to see them. But Nanaimo is affected right across, and this is a very large community. Um, but 50% of the events occur within reasonable walking distance from where we're standing right now, or sitting right now. Um, whether we're looking at ambulance responses, whether we're looking at fatalities, uh, we've used a variety of different measures. We do have an idea of where the intensity is, and it comes back to half are occurring here. Half then are widely dispersed across the rest of the community. It is a concern for us because we want to know how to reach that group, but that's not going to be reached by a, a single site. Okay. 
we may need to be looking at other approaches. And we've talked about disseminated models in the past. Right now, um, we're precluded in this community of someone who is wanting to consume actually coming to another location, even the hospital, or perhaps a physician's office, and saying, hey, you know, I, I'm worried. Would you at least watch me while I consume this? And if I have an overdose, respond. Okay, so we've got lots of barriers up. And that is more where I suspect the future is going to be taking us. Um, I'm also going to, before I go to that, um, we have newer therapies that are coming along. Your current definition in the zoning bylaw specifies methadone clinics or the like, which is can be interpreted as any of our opiate agonist therapy activities that we've been trying to promote. We are likely to be moving forward on newer therapies. Okay. Um, people talk about injectable heroin. That is only one. Now we've got longer acting products that are coming out, um, a new device which is actually the de delivery mechanism. These are going to require specialized locations. Can't go ahead yet. Okay. One, they're not available here, but can't go ahead as long as that methadone clinic comparator is in the existing wording. Okay, so lots of reasons to change. It doesn't, I'm not going to stand here and tell you what it should change to. That's part of the upcoming consultation process, I hope. But I had hoped that we were there about a year ago. I did want to share for you because lots of people asked me what happened with um, the encampment and the, during that time. Now, these are weekly visits to the overdose prevention site. The lower line are people who are consuming. The upper line are people actually going to our overdose prevention site because we do provide additional services there in terms of harm reduction supplies and information and some linkage. And they actually get recorded at the Nanaimo site. So we actually have information on both. And as you notice, about twice as many people actually go there not to consume as go there to consume. Okay. I consider that a real success in terms of our service delivery. We know there are other locations as well. When the encampment went up, we saw a fairly substantive reduction very quickly in terms of both uh, harm reduction supply or other visits as well as consumption visits. That kind of been creeping back up for the last few months of the encampment. And then it bounced back up to almost the same level that it was at prior to the encampment. As a matter of fact, it may actually be coming up even higher. So uh, the encampment definitely resulted in an environment where people may have perceived that it was safer to utilize because they actually got 24-hour response within the encampment than they did up at the overdose prevention site. Despite the fact that we now have two... Uh, trailer housing locations <laughs> uh, and there is some attempt to address the consumption within those two sites so it's safer. We've seen a, a rebound to the same levels prior to and it's unlikely that those pe residents of those two sites are actually coming to the overdose prevention site. So I just wanted to put that out there. Either these were the ones that were so hard to house that they remain street oriented at this point in time, uh, or there's another clientele group that perhaps were even going down to the um, encampment in order to consume. You will see a drop off here. Um, just to remind people that was the t period of time of snow and the real cold and fully expect that we're going to see weather related events like that. I've looked at them for the entire uh, island and similar reductions almost all of our sites during the snow events. Last point that I wanted to raise with you is that drug addicts, drug addiction are passe terms. We don't use them. You've heard me referring to substance use disorders. Uh, drug addiction has become a very stigmatizing term. Okay, it is not a recognized medical diagnosis. Substance use disorders are medical recognized. So again, another rationale for looking at the zoning bylaw because the language in there is actually offensive to those that have substance use, uh, who are using substances, um, some of whom are not actually even substance diagnosed with a substance use disorder. So how do we 
modernized language within the zoning bylaw as well. Um, I flagged in there that we're actually seeing some barriers now in terms of where we want to go forward until we have this issue resolved and that's the challenge that I think uh, uh, Council has in front of it going forward and I do appreciate that that's a significant challenge in terms of the resolution but until the zoning bylaw is resolved we're also not going forward with a supervised consumption site application. When and if we decide to go forward, that's something that'll be done together. Uh, when we went forward with the first application process, we did that together. We expect that that will occur again. The requirements currently at a federal level, I expect they're actually gonna change, but that doesn't mean that we would wanna put something that's gonna cause a problem somewhere. <laughs> Um, I think that's just good governance and the one commitment that you get from me and Norma Winspers who are back at the, who's our mental health and substance use community manager. We also have Kirsten Stewart who's actually managing the overdose prevention site here as well. All of these actually understand good neighborly uh, relations and I think that that's part of what happens with any siting process. Uh, and all I can do is encourage you, don't legislate it, because when you legislate out drugs, it didn't work either. When you legislate out a solution here, I don't think it's going to work. I think that we've got to figure out how we do this the right way. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Hasselbeck. Councilor Bonner? Thank you, Your Worship. So you to Dr. Hasselbeck. Uh, <clears throat> who pays for these two sites once they're set up? Not you. Through, through your worship. <laughs> okay. I just want to be clear about that. Okay, this is a health service. Um, the current overdose prevention sites are funded through Island Health. Okay. Um, if you see any caution in me, I think that some of the newer sites that are coming along that are site specific associated with low barrier housing are going to be incorporated into those housing locations and we have a couple of those models down in uh, Victoria and we've got multiple ones happening over in uh, Vancouver and they're not actually funded by the health system. Okay. Um, but that's why I stressed, not you, this isn't a civic responsibility. Oh. Um, I, uh I agree 100 percent the importance of, of getting moving and getting this application for the, the supervised and consumption site. Um, in terms of other gaps in the community, in terms of uh, dealing with this uh, crisis um, and uh, substance abuse illness, uh, do we have sufficient support and funding for for, for detox and rehabilitation for Thank you, through and through your worship. Uh, I'm gonna call upon my colleague, Ms. Winsper, to actually distribute what we have out there because I know she brought it along and she was looking for an opportunity. So hopefully we can do that, which actually provides a listing of a whole variety of services out there. Um, I, you know, do we ever have enough? That's a really good question. When our services are fully utilized, it means that there's capacity for more. Okay. Um, I think that if we, if I was looking at this and I go back to that sort of graphic that I showed you of the, the helm and the boxes that are out there that um, certainly I think there's some more upfront earlier intervention activities that need to be expanded upon. Okay, uh, I think that there's some more downstream, not just the housing, but the community-based supports about the networking and what does that look like that needs to be built upon. And in particular, we really don't have a lot of recovery-based programs that engage individuals who have had or are in recovery from substance use disorders in terms of their contribution. And as I say, the thing that they wake up to and sort of say, hey, this is a good day. I actually want to go out there and contribute within my community. Uh, we really need to be building those areas. Just to follow up, so just ask again, like, I've worked in the addition field, I worked at the Guthrie um, Center there, the corrections, and there's a lot of individuals that I see that are out there, they're working, they, they relapse, and the, the duration for their time to get them into detox and then to get them to, uh, and then once they're out of detox, then there's this, very, seems to me like a very long gap before there's 
uh, rehab available for them. And so I, I'm just curious, uh, is, there, is there a gap in those rehabilitation services that are available for individuals so they're not waiting uh, two weeks, two months, three months, four months sometimes while they're motivated to get into a rehabilitation service? Okay, in Through Your Worship, I'm, I'm just going to say for alcohol, substance use disorders, rehabilitation uh, in an in-facility, um, there's probably some benefit there. There are community-based programs as well. I do think that the best practice at this point in time for opiate and other substances is not an inpatient rehabilitation facility. I know there's a lot of push from the community and I hear an awful lot that that's what we need. That actually isn't the best practice and may actually put those individuals at risk subsequently. So you don't hear us standing up saying, well, we need more rehab beds. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Norma, do you want to add anything there? If I could, Your Worship. Please. I didn't dress accordingly. Um, as far as wait lists, etc., and I did bring a variety of resources, and, and after I'd love to go over them with anyone that could speak. Um, we do actually have a mobile withdrawal um, protocol and process going. We actually have a pilot of home detox. Um, we also have very shortened wait lists. We have two uh, primary walk in services, both at Brooks Landing and Barron's Road sites that will allow people to have um, same-day service and same-day treatment options, and it's a walk-in self-referral. Uh, so wait lists are really becoming a thing of the past within the Health Authority and Island Health Mental Health Substance Use Programs and Services, as we've looked at creating little barrier, no barrier, including a substance use outreach specialty team that has a one number card that anyone can phone in the community to get immediate service. So that's been our primary um, opportunity is looking at the continuum of healthcare services under the substance use portfolio and looking at low to no barrier access points. So uh, to, to clarify, so there is uh, somebody would like to detox. They, there's two points where they can walk in and be immediately put into a detox. No, they would be, there's detox is a medical, it yeah. depends on what you're looking at, there's yeah. multiple detoxes, right? Yeah. There's a medical detox that yeah. is, as Dr. Hatzfak has talked about, is primarily set up for life-threatening detoxes such as those off alcohol and or opiate. We, mm -hmm. As Dr. Hatzfak mentioned now, we're looking at the opiate a lot differently mm -hmm. and looking at alternatives to just institutional go to therapy detox mm -hmm. at the top of the tap. Mm -hmm. So alcohol detox seems still the primary uh, concern at therapy detox. Mm -hmm. You may have a short wait, but we actually would put foot provide wraparound services for you while you're waiting and looking to see what else you may or may not require during that wait. And we do expedite people, especially those who are looking at opiate agonist therapy. You can actually go into clear new detox. You can have a, a planned detox from your substance of choice that is a medical complication and then you can also start on an opiate agonist therapy treatment while in the detox. So you're doing a detox, you're doing a treatment assessment and you're leaving with treatment and follow-up. Mm -hmm all within a time frame. There may still be a short wait, but we'll make sure that if you if you're at risk during the wait, we'll make sure there's other people wrapped around to either from our services or a nonprofit that we've contracted or a community partner. Great, thank you. And uh, sorry, another question if I may. Uh, those other focuses for opioid um, support, <coughs> what would they be like? So, so say if the community is saying, you know, there's not enough uh, Rehabilitation services, blah, blah blah. What is the what is the focus that Island Health is, is thinking that is more effective to, to sort of to deal? And thanks, Your Worship. And you understand now why I bring along Ms. Winsper to answer some of these questions. But um, fundamentally, in answer to your question, I think that with the establishment and the availability of opiate agonist therapies, okay, and I'll come back. You use the term methadone clinic or the like. Mm -hmm. These are the methadone-like substances, but they're different. Mm -hmm. They're better. They're much better. Okay. And with the establishment and availability and accessibility to those medical interventions, some of which are the newer ones that are coming out, um, they're remarkable new additions to the provision of health services to individuals with substance use disorders. Okay. That's where the main focus has been, and we've seen substantive growth in the utilization of those particular services. We're tracking that very closely. Mm -hmm. um, there are still uh, pockets that support an abstinence-based type of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say that's not what 
I mean, they're at least out there, and if someone truly does want to head that direction, uh, and there are preferences for that, there are ways of channeling people into those sorts of programs. Okay. Um, I think we sat in this room and we're really hearing from some of our peer workers out in the community about their, um, they're going to be encouraging the use of cannabis as a substitute for opiates. And I'm going to say, I don't think we've got really good science behind it, um, but at least I'm going to say there's a thrust that's happening in there. So I think there are three different directions. Depending on who you're in touch with and who you're contacting with, I think that from the medical, from the health services, uh, it's going to be predominantly the opiate agonist therapy, some to the abstinence component. Uh, and I think we're going to learn more about cannabis. I think that's just one that you're going to be watching for the next two to three years uh, and expect that you're going to see substantive changes. I just don't know what it's going to look like. Thank you, through the chair. So, if I understand correctly, some of the municipalities have chosen to, um, rather than being site specific with the zoning, that uh, you go towards where medical or dental office is permitted or health services, etc. If council chose to use that flexibility, would you then be able to identify a site? that you would be applying for? Um, through your worship, we've had good conversation with the planning department about uh, potential ways of modifying the bylaws so that there's a, a, an appropriate category, okay, one of which is medical office or medical suite based. Uh, once that occurs, then I think that if we are able and we still are wanting to go forward with the process, uh, then that process would begin. Okay, um, is it a site sort of saying we're going to set it up at 437 Wesley? Um, those decisions haven't been made. I, that's why I provided the criteria to you. If we are required by fair uh, purchasing practices actually to go to an open competition, uh, which we have actually seen, <laughs> okay, we may not actually even have an idea in advance of putting out a call for proposals. Now, that's a business decision. I, I don't expect you to sort of get down to that detail. But we actually have to comply with a variety of different purchasing policies as well. And if this is a purchase service, we may need to comply with that particular policy that will actually drive the first step over um, identifying a particular site. Okay. I think that helps. Yeah, I, and I'm sorry. I'm a, <laughs> I, I know what you're... Uh, my apologies. Yeah. I actually do know what you're after here. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a process. It's not... We know what we're going to be doing. No. Okay? i got to be very clear as we stand here in this room. We have not predetermined a particular site or a particular location, a particular model, because until a fundamental problem gets resolved, we consider that a sufficient barrier to not even have those conversations, and that problem is the zoning bylaw. Thank you, if I may. Um, I understand what, um, what you're saying. I guess what I was just trying to think of is through the process that if council decided to make it where it was more flexible rather than site specific, it might be that there's more options open, I guess is what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. Yes, your worship, through your worship, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Councilor Thank you, your worship. This is a question actually for staff. May I want to take a second to Mr. Lindsay. What zones presently are allowing dental and medical offices? I couldn't list off all of the zones in the city that allow that use, but it would be a very wide variety. I would think the majority of the zones in the downtown core, if not all, the majority of the commercial zones in and around our town centre, so all operating around the hospital, the road mall, the country club, um, and even some of the areas, uh, the office zones in our suburban uh, areas, we're talking about medical and everything, facilities like along the Avenue Road. Okay. Johnny Cash everywhere, man. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, and, and we can sort of back to, the, back to the, where we began today. Um, look, a supervised consumption site isn't providing the drugs. You have to bring your own, so just that, that, that's all it's providing. Um, and I, I want to, I, this doesn't put you on the spot, but 
the biggest issue from the community's perspective, the broader community. I don't mean to disregard the deaths of the individuals and the families who've been affected by that, but particularly around the supportive housing, is the level of crime that results from people stealing to support their drug addictions. So, you know, the question is, uh, are, are we at the time where we would be far better served to simply allow for the consumption of illicit substances provided by the state? So you worship... These like this? Yeah, you worship. Um, I would prefer to be politically benign in response to that, but I'm going to be blunt and say yes. Okay, um, I actually, you know, that's on the table, and I, but I don't think we'll have that depth of conversation until after the federal election, period. And, and I, I apologize for putting you on the spot. It's only because I respect you and believe you to be a man of courage around these issues that I thought I might get the answer I was hoping you'd give because I, I can state publicly uh, I have, I've been coming to this conclusion for a very long time on a personal level that uh, the level of theft, the cost, the community, the rising insurance costs, the public fear, all of these things lead us to the point where we have to have that debate in a very serious and open public way. And coming back to that, I was quite surprised by the statistics you started with, and perhaps you can just illuminate them a little more. Uh, 25 per thousand, is that adult population or is that population generally? Are per, opioid? The per thousand is over the age of 15. Over the age of 15. So that's one in 40. Is that number higher now than it was 20 or 30 years ago? Do you have any idea? Can you give me a general answer? Um, Your Worship, I actually don't think we have comparators uh, in the past. I think most of us were surprised when the initial estimates started coming out. And these are mathematical models that have been used. Uh, this might be a bit on the high side in this community, low in others, but they're probably not that far off. I've got to stress that. And given our, our OAT prescribing, which we actually have very good numbers on, clearly that's not insignificant either. So. Um, but I don't think if we went back 25 years, we actually have good estimates. Um, and this was a hidden epidemic that was occurring. And until five years ago, substance use was the, I'm going to put it this way, the poor cousin of mental health, which was the poor cousin of the health system. And to come back to the alcohol statistics, so we're talking 12 to 15 percent of mm -hmm. the adult population probably have something raining in the abuse area. Yep. And nicotine is dropping. That's correct. I mean, the statistic that astonishes me, I mean, the alcohol numbers seem high, all right, but I, do, I don't describe the statistics. The uh, opioid use disorder statistics are striking to me because I think of it in that context, one in four. And the reason I say that is because we've had estimates here earlier from Mr. LaBerge and others. <coughs> Perhaps we have 500 homeless people in the night. And based on that statistic, and the taking down the population line for kids in this community, say take us down to 70,000 people um, who are 15 or older. What that tells me is that the image of the person who suffers from an addiction issue, I won't be as quite politically modern as you, that number is substantially higher than the number of homeless people. In other words, the homeless population that we are focused on uh, around addiction and, and related mental health issues is what? A quarter, perhaps, potentially, of those who have an opioid use disorder. In other words, those people that we should be concerned about as well as a society are living in houses throughout our community. Your Worship, and that's why I say it's a very disseminated situation. Um, Two-thirds of our fatalities in this community have occurred in a private residence an additional 17% on top of that in someone else's residence. And it's only a small fraction which are occurring outdoors or in a shelter or temporary housing situation. Uh, it's actually a fairly small fraction of our overall fatalities. Councillor Turley, then Councillor Gesselbrook. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Dr. Hasselbeck. Um, with regard to this slide, um, the reference to opioid, can I confess my ignorance on, on, on drugs per se, but 
is that meant to be all illicit drugs or are there other illicit drugs that are not included in that? Um, through your worship, um, thanks. Opioids are that classification that would include heroin, morphine, uh, fentanyl, uh, codeine. Okay, it's a class of groups that um, uh, I'm going to use a street term, which is called downer. Okay, that individuals who take them actually tend to um, become less stimulated, somnolent, less responsive, uh, and that itself is a real message because there's often the perception that these are individuals wildly running around the downtown streets. Okay, they're certainly not. Okay, but that's that category. It does not include the stimulants, uh, which is one group we would think of cocaine, crack, that sort of thing. And the second group is the other amphetamines, uh, crystal meth being a fairly significant component of that in terms of the changing behaviors and changing drug use that we're seeing in our communities at this point in time. We're actually quite concerned about the migration away from opioids to something like crystal methamphetamine in terms of its <coughs> impact is probably greater on a community from a behavioral perspective. Uh, and um, communities like Winnipeg are really getting very concerned about the migration uh, in terms of the change of substances and more so the urgency of addressing substance use or, uh, disorders in general because if what you do is replace your existing substance use disorder with another one that leads to some challenges so hopefully i've simplified it showed you some of the challenges that are occurring um, what happens on the street is a rapidly changing and dynamic environment um, five years Things have changed a lot. So if I could just get a lot of clarification. Um, so the figure of 25 per thousand, then, if you were to include the numbers or whatever that you're referring yeah. to, would that figure be significantly lower? Um, uh, Your Worship, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, what I don't have is the proportion. It's about 1%. So if we're looking at stimulant use disorders, uh, it would be probably another 10 on top of that. But please don't quote me on that. I'd actually like to pull that up. Our estimates on opioid use disorders are made by mathematical modeling as a result of the opioid crisis. And um, I haven't seen good estimates on the stimulant Thank you. use. Thank you. Councillor Gusselbrock. Oh, uh, through the chair. Uh, now, say with the application of um, opioid um, agonist therapy, um, is having a, uh, uh, a supervised consumption site, would that uh, enable the application of those therapies uh, more broadly in the community? or? Um, is that not really a, a determining factor of how those, so I know that, I mean, with methadone, like there's one clinic here that um, I know for sure is, is providing that, and then, I mean, you can access it through the pharmacy in, uh, now, but being able to provide that service, is there, is there something that the city can be doing to facilitate that, or is there any barriers there? And through your worship, I don't think there are any barriers. Um, the application is quite specific to the consumption on site as an exemption of this Controlled Substances Act. I think what we're learning from many of the sites is what are the services that need to be built around that particular location, which include, uh, in some instances, rapid access clinics uh, to get people onto OAT, um, uh, other harm reduction or social supports necessary. They're not a requirement of the supervised consumption site application, interestingly enough. <laughs> uh, they're not a requirement, but uh, in a build out of this nature, it's something that I think is inherent upon us to provide the best possible service. I have another question to ask. I mean, uh, part of the whole thrust of this is to prevent people feeling guilty, taking their drugs in private, etc., because they will be looked down upon and so on. I mean, and with great respect, I, I worked many summers and Christmases in liquor store as a student. And in a small community where I knew husband was perhaps coming in to buy the half gallon of cooking sherry every two days, not for himself, but for his wife, who was a severe alcoholic. So she didn't have to go in and disclose to the community she had an alcohol issue. 
and, and so I'm just wondering if some of the, and I'm looking at staff as well, if some of the places where we have provided consumption uh, sites, in fact, is there a significant reduction or are we just pretending that people are going to now go to these places uh, where they're feeling safe and secure and not looked down upon? In other words, you know, are, are we really going to, are we going to make a significant dent in the problem? I'm throwing it out not because I believe it or think it, but just I think it's a reasonable question to ask. Yeah, Your Worship, I think it's a very reasonable question as well. So all, all I can say is we go back to Insight, we go back to the success of Insight of being able to um, channel individuals who are prepared for treatment into treatment, and they were actually doing a fairly good job of that. Okay, um, With the crisis, I'm, I'm not so sure that there's been a sustaining of those supports. Um, certainly the the flip side of this is do these sites actually promote the use of substances and i think there's pretty good evidence that they do not that the people coming and using the sites are those that are regular users who are quite fearful uh, and one of the intents behind our overdose prevention site um, behind supervised consumption is to develop a trusting relationship um, we won't get a therapeutic relationship or therapeutic success until trust is in place. And you don't get that until someone is comfortable coming back to the same location. Uh, and certainly when I talk to the OPS staff, that that is so fundamental in terms of how they interact with people who are consuming uh, in a non-judgmental fashion so that they can develop that trust for that day when perhaps they're uh, able to have the conversation on what are their options available. Dr. Hasselbeck, thank you very much. Thank you, Worship, and I'll see you in three weeks, I believe. And we'll talk more about alcohol at that time. Thanks very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, I'd ask uh, for the uh, recommended motion on the uh, receipt. Just to receive for information right now. Uh, yes, thank you. Councillor Martin, seconded Councillor Bonner. Discussion? All yes. Those in favor? Thank you. Yeah, oh, discussion. Sorry. We're receiving all these reports. Are we going to be acting on these reports in the near future? I can't predict, Councillor, when exactly we'll be acting upon them, but I think the whole concept behind today's presentation is to provide us with the necessary background that we might be able to make intelligent decisions in due course. And I appreciate your enthusiasm to move forward, as I always do, and I say that as a compliment, not in a sarcastic tone. But having said that, yes, the, I, we receive and we'll have to deal with these issues because uh, there's no question these are issues. Right? May, may I ask a question then as a process, like what, this will come back to us at a later date with more options? I think we will be seeing further recommendations from staff and reports and also further discussion as council as to how we're going to respond to the information that we're receiving today. And certainly I would hope in greater numbers than we have available today too. Okay. These are important decisions. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Contrary? None. Motion carried. Daytime drop-in centers. Mr. Horn? And Ms. Cronson. And Ms. Cronson. Two for one. Yes. Thank you. Right, so, so um, the last part of today's presentation is about the daytime resource center. And just to refresh your memory, when the rezoning for the supervised consumption service at 437 Wesley came forward, a number of citizens from the downtown came forward to express their dissatisfaction with the state of affairs down here. They had a lot of complaints about anti-social behaviors and things that were going on. And Council of the Day directed us, as staff, to go back and identify those issues and then bring back a suite of responses to those things. So staff went around the downtown core and we talked to all the merchants and we talked to the businesses and the residents downtown and we gathered up their concerns. We came back to council with a package of responses. One of the responses we identified was the State Time Resource Centre. And the basis of that response was two concerns voiced by the merchant class and the residents downtown. One was, where do people go all day? Because if they don't have somewhere to go, they'll stand in front of my shop and they'll panhandle and now my customers don't come into my store anymore. Two, 
Where do they go to the washroom all day? If they have nowhere to go, they choose the front of my building to do that function in. And then three, um, the Vancouver Island Regional Library. I'm open to the general public. I have now become the de facto drop-in resource center for the homeless in Nanaimo. But my staff are librarians, not mental health and addictions workers. They're not outreach workers, they're librarians. So we're now managing, on behalf of the community, a drop-in center for homeless individuals really isn't what we're set up to do. So on the basis of those things that were fed back to us and other comments in those lines, we felt that one possible response was to create a place for people to go during the day. And maybe we could address some of those concerns. It's one possible response, it's not the only one, but we're here to tell you a little bit more about that idea. So a drop-in center, as you can figure, is a place to go for people without stable housing, and they can go there and they can be sheltered from the elements. That's an important part because we do have long, cold, wet winters here, and what do people do all day? And then um, secondly, we really wanted to provide um, a place where people could go and they could get the supports and access the services that they need. So it's difficult for an outreach worker to find your client if they have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday at 2 o'clock and the client's living under a tarp in Bone Park. They don't know if it's Tuesday, never mind 2 o'clock. So it is tough for them to connect people to services. A drop-in centre might serve the function of having a place where workers can go find the client, it's Tuesday at 2 o'clock, let's go to the doctor. So the drop-in centre is, is characterised in a couple of different ways, but we're going to take that apart a little bit further for you today. You can see what the benefits are almost uh, automatically. Shelter from the elements, that's number one. Uh, we want to take the stress off our malls, our parks, and our libraries, and the public spaces in our community. We want to help the outreach workers, as I mentioned, to find their clients. We want to have a place that's not just a couch and coffee environment because that's not sufficient, although that's what the clientele may well want. We do want to provide an, a, an environment that supports their movement towards wellness and sobriety. And that will be at their pace, naturally, but nonetheless we want to provide an environment where that happens. And then, um, really, it's one of the recommendations coming out of the Homeless Action Plan developed by the Nanamo's Homeless Coalition. What are we going to do over the next decade? One of the suggestions coming out of that group was we need a health and wellness centre for people to go during the day. So. Now you may be thinking, those of you who are from Nanaimo or been around for a while, haven't we tried this before? Yes, there was a drop-in centre. Um, it was called The Living Room, I believe was the name. And fortunately the fellow who was running The Living Room is still around, Mike Kirby, so we had a chance to chat with him about his memories of that time. Uh, it was open for about two years and the funding was through the Salvation Army but operated by Island Crisis Care Society. They were open six hours a day, seven days a week. They had two locations that they tried, one on um, Victoria and then moved on to Nichols, 55, or no, Nichols then Victoria. And then when the New Hope Centre opened, then the funding shifted and the centre closed. So there were a lot of lessons learned from that time. It was some benefit. There are some, you know, difficulties with the indoor-outdoor dynamic because, of course, people need somewhere to smoke their cigarettes and what have you. So that was one of the things Mike pointed out. He said, if you're thinking about doing this again, please find somewhere that has a good outdoor space associated with it. Um, you might also say, isn't there some kind of drop-in service in Nanaimo right now? Well, actually, there are a number of different places people um, can go for resources, and all of them are great. All of them are very well utilized. None of them are every day of the week consistently, and most of them have some sort of limitation or prerogative as far as the clientele go, um, whether it's the Women's Centre or the Seniors Connect. Um, the, I would say probably best known is the Phoenix House. Is it Phoenix House? Yeah, Phoenix Center. Phoenix Center. I'm not sure if that's still the name it goes by. No, Norma says no. Okay, formerly known as the Phoenix Center, used to operate out of Bino. Now it's in the bottom of the Nanaimo Youth Services Association building, um, right by the Bastion. Uh, it's open six hours a day, three days a week, and it is open to everyone. But guests should not be under the influence. So that's understandable. They want to make sure it's a safe environment for everyone. On, I should say, operated by the Canadian Mental Health Association. Uh, same group that operates the opiates. So that is kind of the landscape of what we have right now as far as existing resource centers go. And everyone's doing fantastic work, everyone's very busy. 
So where we're at is council support in um, 2018 as a result of our um, response to social and health issues in the city centre, I think the report was called. Council allocated $100,000 per annum. When we spoke to council of the day, we were clear you cannot run a daytime drop-in centre seven days a week on that kind of money. It's insufficient. But we're also clear that you, if you're going to lure other money, it sure helps to have a little bit on the table. So Council's decision was to provide $100,000 annually, and then the direction was to go seek other partners to help us uh, both finance this thing and, of course, operate and manage it on a daily basis, which is probably not a job your city staff should be doing. So it's really, there is $100,000 per annum. Please go We'll see if you can make such a thing um, occur and go talk to other partners in the community who might contribute financially and logistically to that. So the way that this played out in July, we brought back a staff report on estimated costs recommending that the mayor write a letter to the MLA of the day. It sounds very familiar to some people in the room, I'm sure. Uh, council did go with that uh, recommendation and the meeting happened. At the same time, Tent City was escalating. So that occupied, well, they occupied a lot of our time, but it also actually took away the need for a drop-in centre temporarily because it kind of became the de facto drop-in centre for a while. And then after that was closed, discussions resumed. Um, I believe Councillor Thorpe, you may recall someone from Art Place Society. Yeah, they reached out to uh, the city in a couple different ways and we did meet with them. They came down to Nanaimo just to sort of scope out what the possibilities might be for some sort of collaboration, which I'll tell you a bit about in a second. But first, scope of services. So these are um, the kind of things we anticipated perhaps could go into a drop-in centre, and we probably have a better name for that. As I know, a number of rolls our eyes every time I say drop-in. It should be a health and wellness facility, really. And so the shower program that we currently fund would be logical to have that be a component of a centre like this. Uh, health supports like foot and wound care, that's very common when we had the living room back in the day. A lot of the staff's day was feet treatment and wound care. Um, counseling and advocacy services, wellness supports, absolutely. We're looking at housing placement programs because, again, if we're having to find places for people to live, that's a good way to do it from that kind of site. Uh, income assistance, currently they sit at the New Hope Center, the income assistance folks once a week to process applications from homeless individuals, so that could take place in this facility. Clothing and program uh, laundry facilities are always on the request, you know, the, there's always demand for that. Um, meal programs, uh, currently we provide space for the 710 breakfast program. Maybe it makes more sense to have the breakfast program integrated into a resource centre. Um, and then also social and recreational program. There is that component to these lives and we would want to address that as well. All right, so uh, we mentioned Our Place Society. You have an attachment there that has a sort of very high level scope of service um, funding option from them and they came down we told them what we were working with and they said well we can work with that for those of you who aren't familiar with it it's one of the biggest um, service agencies in victoria they've expanded tremendously actually uh, in just in the last few years they have a drop-in center that serves over a thousand meals per day but they also have transitional housing they have a therapeutic recovery center that was somewhat modeled on the guthrie house it's a two-year program so they do a lot of different things and they do a lot of fundraising it's partially government fund, uh, funded but partially private donations so they're interested in coming to Nanaimo, but they understand this needs to be something that works for us. It has to be the best option from the perspective of all the service providers in the community and, of course, the council's direction. So that's a little bit of explanation of the attachment to your council report. Uh, council Martin. Um, all this, I may be skipping ahead, but um, I will ask one question, if I may, through the chair. Um, does the Cellian provide breakfast? To the residents. Only to their guests. They do have a dinner program, though. Except for one Saturday month. Or does it? Are you talking about the 710 breakfast? No, I'm talking about Salvation Army. Salvation Army? Okay, so that's not usually on the agenda. And I didn't know if you were, I was going to look at the summary of monthly budgets. Because um, one scenario isn't on there, and it's kind of probably halfway in between, would be, I don't see any purpose in having um, a living room, or well, I was involved in the living room, uh, which excited me then, so this excites me now. Um, there's no purpose in opening it for two hours, in my mind, in my opinion. 
Um, so I was like, what would it be open seven days a week, five hours a day, because that's the scenarios we're being given here, with snacks, but not a dinner. Could probably look at the budget for so just the snacks. In between, right? Yeah, you could probably knock off about um, ten thousand dollars from the monthly budget. Cause you could look at the you could look at the yeah. basically the, the budget there for food is the snack budget under the seven days two hours option. Right. I think they just gave us options with various levels because they're interested yeah. in providing you know a bunch of different <clears throat> scopes. Right, but I agree that uh, it, I think if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. So one comment from my place society was that they started small as well. They started a couple hours a day, and then they grew that into the current program, which is seven days a week. I think it's eight hours a day. They've also coupled their program with a residential function and meal program and all sorts of other things. So they get to do some piggybacking on other services. Okay. But they were like, they came to us and said, we're okay with starting small and growing. That's probably okay. preferable to trying to leap out of the can with seven days a week. So that was in good information for us because they thought that was a good business model. Start small and grow it. So that's something to think about. And just one statement to that. One business I don't want to see expanding, but unfortunately. Right. Um, so we, of course, the question is, where does this land? And, and, and these things are all double-edged swords in some ways. So if you provide a drop-in resource center for folks, and we take the stress off our library and parks, that's a good thing. The other thing is, though, of course, everyone's now going to one location, and that's potentially going to have an impact. So everything comes, you know, it's a bit two-sided, right? Um, one thing we looked at is, okay, if we were to proceed with this, uh, what would be our siting considerations? And so we have a whole bunch of them, of course. Is the building available? Just like Island Health, they don't have a universe of choices. It's what buildings are commercially available in your community. Um, does the ownership agree? Do they want to use it for this purpose? Um, is the zoning appropriate? Does the building code requirements, are they met in this particular building? And that's much more p tougher than you think. And then we have occupancy loads and we have proximity to other services. It's really clear when we talk to practitioners and uh, RCMP and members of the community who are doing this every day. If you put this thing too far away, they say, you might as well not have it. Right? So proximity is a big issue. You've got size requirements. If you want showers and, and uh, therapy rooms and uh, wellness centers and wound treatment, you're going to have to have a bigger facility than you are just if you just want to do couches and coffee. So there's all that. We have um, the availability of an outdoor courtyard space. The lesson learned from the last living room was that we generated considerable conflict with the community by, geez, there's nowhere to go but the sidewalk to stand and have our cigarettes and chat. And so, you know, citizens had to wade through that huddle to get past them. And that was a difficult thing. And also the proximity and the closeness to some outdoor a usable space for folks to congregate. And then um, the potential impact on the neighborhood, that's very site specific in terms of its sensitivity and its, its impact. And then really, uh, are there other tenants in that building? Because some are multi-tenanted buildings we're looking at. So a whole range of considerations. We're not here today to, to specify particular sites or things, but these are all the things that we're looking at when we're contemplating where might we land one of these, should we find the, the, the additional dollars and the support to do it. So, I heard a very good question about next steps. We want to say this is just one possible way forward. It's not at all the case this is the only way forward. It may be that in further discussions that augmenting existing services is a preferable use of resources. So that's a conversation we continue to have. But we wanted to give you an update because this was a decision that was made by the previous council and it's one that stands in your budget. So we're continuing to work on it. Uh, when we have uh, some options for you to consider, we're going to be coming back with another report. And there's a possibility if it is uh, something that needs a more expensive budget than the one that's been provided, we'll be again asking for you to forward a request to the provincial government. So that's a possibility for your future. But we basically just wanted to give you an update on this project and answer any questions you may have. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, I don't believe I have any questions, uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to thank staff for, for coming forward and giving this update because, frankly, I wondered what had happened to this initiative. Uh, you're quite right. It was at a it was at a workshop on homelessness, and I think Mr. Leberge gave an excellent presentation at the same workshop. But the people from our place were there, and I had a conversation with them afterwards. And subsequently, they did reach out to the to the city, and I, of course, put them on to staff. 
to me, they seem like a, a potential uh, good partner, uh, somebody who's done this before, who uh, who has experience that we can we can certainly use and build upon. So I, I'm really enthused that this is uh, still on the books. Uh, I support in general the idea of a drop-in uh, center, but as Councillor Martin said, we want to do it right. And so I'm really pleased that we're still making progress in that direction. So well done. Look forward to future updates. I may just add the one. We think our place will be a good partner for us in this work. They're experienced providers of this kind of resource centre. The second piece I would say is that our colleagues in Island Health at the Mental Health and Addictions and Substance Use Services are going to be our other key partners. We really need to do this with everybody in our community, uh, the health providers, with our colleagues in the non-profit sector. Um, just us in our place isn't going to work. It has to be everyone in, and what that means is they have to have their needs met when they come to those facilities. If they want to invest in these or participate in, it's going to have to meet their needs. So it's going to be more complicated than meeting the merchant's needs, our needs, our place's needs. Every partner we invite in is going to come in with, here's what I need from that space. And so it's going to get more and more complicated as we move along, but that's the only way to do this effectively, is to have the full support of our all the providers in our community and, this front, uh, and the health authority. So. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship, to your staff. Um, it, it's quite a daunting task you, you set up for you. Um, do, when this report comes to us, or in this year, um, is it your, are you going to be able to provide the, the, the capacity to manage this thing, like to set it up? Um, are we going to be looking at putting more money in and, and to have another organization and just have them do it? Um, I'm just concerned that you know it, it, this may be such a large project that, that we might just have to farm it over. So. Yeah, we will be looking at engaging an operator. It wouldn't be city staff operating the, the drop-in centre. <coughs> Would it make a $100,000 contribution? Um, and then provide one of their ancillary supports, which we often do, which would be uh, sanitation supports, for example, or um, other ways that would be in kind supports, plus $100,000, and we would have a third party running in the other I hope we're going to take the approach my mother taught me about something I really, really, really wanted. Go back and wait a week and see if you still really, really want it. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Rich. Um, now that I'm thinking about your mom and her own uh, there, I'm almost afraid what I have. Maybe perhaps someone else has a question. I'll remember again. Worship, just uh, Mr. Rudolph, kind of go back to the strategic plan for a second. I was looking at it, uh, where does this fit? This fits under the subject, I think, of livability. And there's a <coughs> focus area called social connectivity. And it says, continue to facilitate solutions for social issues impacting our community and residents. So this, this then forms into one of those action items underneath the, in the strategic plan. And you know, but the emphasis was on facilitate, not necessarily uh, implement ourselves. So I mean, that's just an example where this nests in under our, our own strategic plan so far, and how we start to unpack that as it layers in. You know, so. Just an example of that, but we have sort of argued, I think, that to this point, that we are more trying to be facilitators on the issues of social uh, issues in the community as opposed to being responsible for things like sewer and water, police, fire, and those types of things. So, just conceptually, if you want to think of it that way, so we, as we come back with our layers of implementation plans and that type of thing, where does where does this fit? That's kind of an example of where that might. Be. Councilbrook, go ahead. Uh, uh, through the chair, I'm just curious on the um, funding um, distribution for our place in Victoria. Say just around their uh, drop-in center portion of their facilities. How much does the city contribute? How much does private? How much does the province contribute to to this type of setup? I believe it's around a 50-50 between government contribution. I'd have to look more carefully, but it's as significant as private amount as private donations. The city, I don't know how much money they give. The city of Victoria gives yeah. them per year. I know they recently funded that initiative of the lockers for people's carts. That came, that money came from the city of Victoria. I think the substantial yeah. amount of funding that goes to our place is provincial measure. Right. In terms, uh, I mean, this is something that seems to be a, a very important 
amenity. Uh, you know, if you're if you're homeless and, and just get laundry, different medical services to somewhere to charge your phone, even have a hope to kind of take the ne next steps on. This is an important conduit to to facilitate that. Um, what um, I'm I'm just curious to say if the city isn't facilitating the movement on this project forward, who would who who, who who could possibly be able to, to, to do that or, or, or move the project forward? Well, if I may comment, the, the Canadian Mental Health Association is the group we identified as running what's closest to this thing now. Mm -hmm. And they work closely with their health authority partners, some of them here today. And I know that that facility and service they run, which is really a CMHA project, that there's lots of support from that from the health authority. What I would say for this drop-in center is we're trying to solve a problem that's almost uniquely ours, which is that we have issues in our public domain, in the public realms of our city that we're trying to address. So uh, we're the most motivated to uh, provide a place for people to go during the day that's for that purpose, to reduce the amount of folks on our streets, to, to manage some of that public disorder. The partners that are going to be working with us on this have a motivation to provide wellness and health services. Mm -hmm. That may not look like a drop-in resource center to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were deciding that we're not going to do this piece of work, then the other partners who would be potential collaborators, they may have different avenues to get the things they were going to get at with this thing. So I would say that we're the drivers because we're trying to solve a particular problem. The Homeless Coalition believes this is valuable, mm -hmm. basically because of human dignity. What do you do in a wet November day all day long? How do you stay dry and warm? It's really difficult. And what the experts suggest is that we'll see less of a take up on something like this during the summer months when it's really pleasant to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. And what will happen in the winter months is here's a place where I can go stay warm and dry. So the Homeless Coalition supports this because that's just a fundamental of human life. How do I stay warm and dry? In, in all November, December, January, for, until the sun comes back out again. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know if that's it's a bit of a nuanced answer to your question. Well, but, just, yeah, just following up on that, I mean, the um, this was one of the, the ten suggested strategy uh, for that was put forward in the homelessness coalition strategy, and I think it's something that you know that the council all endorsed, uh, you know, going into the election and, and that. So different members. All right. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm through your staff. Um, has it ever been considered that we would have more than one of these places? And the other question is, would these places be suitable for a substance um, cons consumption site? And if so, can we charge everyone health an awful lot of rent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rent in space. Well, to answer the first one, I think the cost might be a bit prohibitive to have more than one. I mean, at this point, we're trying to figure out how to fund one. I think it would be ideal to have more than one, but we're going to start with one for now. And see how it goes. The uh, folks in Victoria, we discussed with them the um, viability or advisability of having a supervised consumption service within such a facility, a drop-in center, a resource center. One of the comments they made to us was sometimes those are very separate cultures. So there are those who are going to use a supervised consumption service, and there are those who are going to go to a drop-in resource center. And sometimes they're one and the same person, but sometimes they're not. And so if you begin to mix people who are um, daily users of injectable street drugs with people who may have uh, an anxiety disorder, and find themselves homeless, they may not cohabit in the same space very comfortably. And what will happen is you'll drive away some of those folks who aren't that part of that harder street culture. It's a, it's a delicate balance, right? So um, that was just one comment. Yes, you could do such a thing, but be aware that you're going to change the dynamics of who's coming into your space. And it's probably going to get harder if you, do, if you mix those things. And so while that's still on the table as a dialogue and a discussion, we're, we're cautious about what it implies in terms of who's going to end up using this space. So. Uh, any further questions? Before I call for the motion, I just want to say thank you very much to staff for continuing to work on this difficult issue, which Mr. Horn wisely reminded us at the start of today is not properly speaking, either ours jurisdictionally, constitutionally, or otherwise, and yet we bear the, the brunt as a community. Uh, with the lack of resources and, and 
the effect of laws and public policy from the two higher levels of government. Uh, and I would say, therefore, in a second, what uh, Councillor Thorpe had to say earlier, how much we appreciate it. Um, this is a difficult issue. I want to say thank you to Dr. Hasselbeck, Mr. Minister, and others, others who come out to listen today. Obviously, um, this council doesn't have control over uh, many uh, of what are potentially the solutions, or at least things that would alleviate uh, some of the problems that arise from this. But uh, to carry on from what Councillor Bonner was hinting at, probably we will be dealing with uh, in the future. We are all getting an even greater education around these issues, and I think that's really important so that hopefully we can make intelligence decisions. I respect the fact that um, we're not talking about a population that is uh, entirely uh, alike. Uh, Mr. Horn made the point, you know, that people who have anxiety disorders don't necessarily want to be in the same place as someone with a suffering from a mental health issue. And, and I don't mean to make light of this, it's just that some people prefer candidly to go to McDonald's for their coffee and others might want to go to Starbucks. Human beings are human beings and they make choices and they have individual personalities. And I think we have seen recently at the, uh, the two sites, both at Lavue and Terminal, that people are mixed together who perhaps probably shouldn't be mixed together. Uh, and there are consequences for the community. At the end of the day, we have a significant portion of our community who are upset about what they perceive or and is, uh, I think, statistically supported increases in crime in their neighborhoods and all of those issues. And we are the ones on the front lines. And so we will be back at this issue shortly. But uh, as we do so, we'll do so uh, with the assistance of an able staff who've been so good in their presentation today to us. So I want to thank them again and perhaps call for the motion now. Move to receive. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary, motion carried. Ms. Curry, do we have any uh, questions? Um, it's empty. Mr. McMahon tells me the question she was asking. Therefore, uh, the appropriate uh, item uh, on the agenda now would be a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Martin, seconded Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, I can't. 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 Yes,